ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for joining today's web conference, the Market Surveillance Committee meeting. Please note that all participant lines will be muted until Q&A. To ask a question over the phone, please dial pound 2 into your telephone keypad. If, however, you require technical assistance, please send a private note to me, the event producer, or call our help desk at 888-796-6118. I would now like to formally begin today's conference and introduce Dr. Benjamin Hobbs, Chair of the Market Surveillance Committee. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Market Surveillance Committee meeting of the California ISO. Um, um, as usual, we have a packed agenda with very important uh, issues, flexible ramping product and price performance analysis in the afternoon. Um, hopefully, you've all seen the report. That's really good. Uh, and then in this, this morning, we'll be devoted to the system market power discussion. The board's going to be um, uh, considering about whether to bless a, a stakeholder effort come uh, in their November meeting. And uh, the staff have a proposal uh, with some modifications that they'll be presenting. So, uh, uh, but before we do all that, as usual, I'd like to open up um, uh, the, the phones to any public comments that anybody wants to make on any other issue, or if there's anybody in the room who wants to make a comment. So let me first ask, is there anybody in the room who would like to make a comment on any issue other than what's on the agenda? Okay. Uh, operator, can you check to see if there's anybody on the phones who would like to make a public comment? We do have one. Caller, your line is unmuted. Hey, this is Michelle Keto from Energy Division at the CPC, and I just had three comments I wanted to make. So the first comment is that um, I'm not sure it's on your agenda for the future, but we're very interested in the CPM soft offer cap, um, and the MSC has opined on this in the past, and we're really hoping that that goes on a future agenda for the MSC when the CPM soft offer cap is being developed and approved. So that's my first comment. So my second comment is that, as you know, the bid cap is going to be raised from $1,000 to $2,000 in the fall of 2020. Um, as you also know, the um, bids from internal resources above $1,000 can't go through the market unless they cost justify. However, bids from importers don't need to cost justify above $1,000. So the CAISO has indicated that they will open a stakeholder initiative to address this, and my questions are twofold, um, one of which is which stakeholder initiative would that be addressed in? Maybe you guys don't know. But secondly, if, if um, and when it comes up, we would like the MSC to issue an opinion. That's really important from our perspective. So that's my second ask. So these are two future agenda items. Um, and then I just wanted to do a little follow-up on the RMR opinion that the MSC wrote um, and I just wanted to know that CAISO, as well as MSC, have indicated that the RMR is a mandatory regime, um, and I believe that was in the MSC comments. And I just wanted to give you a little feedback that um, Calpine, which was under RMR contract, returned to the market. Um, it's still, those resources are likely still needed for reliability, but they chose to get a contract. Um, from my perspective, that's not a mandatory regime, and I just wanted to give you that feedback given that that was in your paper that went to Burke. So those are my three comments. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, uh, we'll miss having you here today, but I, uh, hopefully we'll hear from you from the, the, the phones. So the soft offer cap is definitely something that might be on the um, uh, December meeting agenda. And um, let's see, you had a question about um, the handling of external bids above a thousand once the price cap is raised next fall and what initiative that would uh, would address that and I don't know if there's anybody here from the staff Greg yeah this is Greg Cook with the ISO uh, yeah we have an initiative plan as indicated on a roadmap that we put out uh, we had a stakeholder call on, on Monday but as you can see from there we'll be running through a stakeholder initiative starting later this year and currently planning to bring that to our Board of Governors in May, around the May time frame for implementation at the same time that the uh, offer cap gets increased from $1,000 to $2,000. That, that initiative, the scope of that initiative would include import bid cost verification for bids above $1,000 as well as um, how we need to align our 
market optimization parameters with the changing bid cap levels. Okay, thanks, Greg. And regarding your third comment, Michelle, about um, in particular the Calpine resource that chose to get a contract or the RMR, and I just wanted to see if there's anybody who wanted to comment on that. I don't have a comment. Um, I guess that's something we, we should look at. But uh, anyway, thank you, Michelle. Um, uh, let's see, operators, is there anybody else who wants to make a comment at this time? No other people on the line. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next item of the agenda um, are the minutes from the last general session meeting. And by the way, I should uh, introduce the other members of the MSC here. Um, the other members uh, here are uh, Jim Bushnell and Scott, Scott Harvey. Uh, Scott, you'll be hearing from later uh, during the system market power discussion in terms of a presentation. And Jim will hear from throughout, I'm sure. Um, um, okay. Uh, and I'd like to hear from one of you now in terms of having a motion to approve the uh, general session minutes from last time. This is Jim, and I move to approve the minutes. Okay, it's been moved by Jim. This is Scott Harvey. I second the motion. Okay. Um, Jim has moved, and Scott has seconded. Um, any corrections or other discussion? If not, then we can have a vote. Jim? Yes. Scott? Yes. And um, I vote yes. So the minutes from August 19th, 2019 have been approved unanimously, and we will immediately move to um, the system market power discussion, which will take uh, the entire morning. There are, there are three presentations. Perry is going to just tee things up with um, – he has a handful of slides to uh, lay out the broad questions. And uh, because the presentation is short, um, it would be best if we have – if there's extensive discussion, let's save that for after Perry is finished, unless there's, you know, a quick clarifying question. Uh, um, then I have a short presentation about um, whether, in theory, uh, mitigation in one market, um, in particular real time, uh, can effectively mitigate market power in uh, the day ahead market. And it's just a theoretical discussion to show that, in, indeed, this can be the case, but is not necessarily the case. Um, so the classic two-handed economist on one hand and then on the other hand. And then uh, Scott has a more extensive discussion of uh, the, the analysis that he's done as well as the issues raised by uh, system-wide market power mitigation. So Perry, I understand you just got off a plane from somewhere far away. Yes, thank you. So I'm hoping to uh, just tee this up. Um, this is essentially the same material that we talked about two or three weeks ago. Um, and any of the, I, I think that um, Dr. Hobbs and Dr. Harvey has, a, they have a lot of uh, material. They're probably more conducive to discussing the rationale behind these things. And uh, I anticipate that a bulk of the discussion should happen during their presentations. So I'll just recap um, what we put out there in the conceptual design proposal three weeks ago. Um, I, yeah, at a high level, uh, we extend our general market power mitigation design principles. Uh, to the Cal, uh, California ISO balancing area system level. Um, so we've taken kind of the approach that we take in local and just have, uh, extended it up to the balancing area level. Um, and in this design, we only mitigate bids for resources in constrained and potentially uncompetitive areas. And I'll talk about what that means uh, over the next 10 slides. Um, and I'll just add here, I'm not sure if we get really into it in this presentation, but we're considering a phased approach uh, to address implementation timing, um, uh, where in the first phase we do kind of as, uh, as described in the document, uh, implement in, real, in the real-time market, uh, but for our balancing authority area only. Uh, and then in some second phase we could follow up with any necessary um, EIM changes or changes related to commitment cost. Uh, in the day ahead market. Um, and then also, as Greg noted uh, earlier, that we're also, um, we also have an initiative um, for uh, developing intertie bid cost verification for offers above $1,000. That'll be handled in a separate initiative, not, not in this um, potential initiative that we kick off here. All right, so what we've done in the conceptual design proposal 
is extend our general market power mitigation design to the KISO balancing area. Um, so you have what, what you're looking at in this picture is uh, similar to how we do in the local where you, you have an identified constrained area, and I'm showing that here with the red arrows. Let's assume for this example that there are only two entryways into the California balancing area, and that's from the north uh, from D and from the east from C. Um, and in this uh, example, the prices here indicate that we have a constrained area, uh, as, do, as do the red arrows. The price within the constrained area is $300. The price outside of the constrained area is $50. Um, what we're worried about uh, with market power is if suppliers in constrained areas can exercise market power on demand within constrained areas. Um, so that is resource A or B uh, could provide relief on the intertie scheduling limits here. Um, C and D cannot provide relief on the intertie uh, scheduling limits. And we would see first that if this area is uh, constrained, we would then test the competitiveness of the resource mix within the constrained area. Um, here that would be test uh, A and B. Let's, for this example, to keep it simple, assume it's like an RSI 1 um, to make the example make sense. If that would fall below uh, the key threshold of 1, um, then we would uh, say that the area is potentially uncompetitive. And in that situation, we would mitigate suppliers in the potentially uncompetitive and constrained area. And that is we would mitigate um, resource, uh, offers from supplier A and B. So just, just to summarize, we identify a constraint or a constrained area. We test the supplier concentration in that constrained area and then we mitigate resources within that constrained area. Uh, there was, there's a, uh, we had a discussion two and a half weeks ago about um, our test for when we would consider ourselves uh, import constrained and, and, and the proposal um, puts out there that we would consider ourselves import constrained with our major three inner ties simultaneously binding. Um, because that test is not looking at every single inner tie being simultaneously binding, there is a situation uh, that could occur that we're, that we're um, showing in this diagram here, and that is that we could be binding on those three major inner ties but still be price converged with other EIM balancing areas. There's other transmission between us and, and, and the EIM areas. So, if the test to determine when KISO's import constraint does not include all inner ties simultaneously binding situation illustrated here would, would apply, and that is when energy and balance market transfer constraints are not binding, the prices in our area uh, would be converged with other EIM areas, and this means that a supplier in the EIM area could set the market clearing prices above, potentially set the market clearing prices above competitive levels, just like any resource within in the California ISO balancing area. So the, the conceptual design would evaluate this entire uh, supply, the, the entire supply and demand mix within this identified constrained area that includes the other two um, energy and balance market balancing areas. Uh, and then if that test fails, we would mitigate the, the supply offers uh, in the full constrained and uncompetitive area, and that is we would mitigate, you know, if this is constrained area as indicated by the red arrows, and the supply mix um, is in, or does not pass an RSI 3, we would then mitigate resources A, B, E, and F in, in this diagram. So you can, you know, this talks to the interplay between our balancing area and other balancing areas in the energy and balance market. Um, similar to the uh, previous example, you could also run into uh, the situation in which our, you know, major three inner ties are binding and our um, EIM uh, transfer constraints are binding into the California ISO balancing area. In, in this diagram, uh, what we're trying to show is that the KISO balancing area is import constrained here and separated, a price separated from other EIM uh, areas. 
So we would see the constrained area as just the California ISO balancing area. Um, so under the circumstance that we would consider ourselves import constrained and the EIM transfer, uh, transfers are binding, our conceptual design would evaluate and mitigate within the California balancing area. So that is, we would evaluate the supply mix within the balancing area, that's A and B, uh, and if that test fails, that RSI test fails, we would then mitigate um, A, uh, suppliers A and B, you know, all the supply within the area. Okay, so, you know, in the past, we've been arguing a lot about, um, about these questions on this slide, and, that's, you know, could we simply evaluate offers into our market to determine whether we should mitigate rather than, than consider whether we first consider whether we're import constrained or not. Um, and should we consider ourselves import constrained when there's a lack of uh, import bids? Um, so in order to kind of look at these two questions, uh, we, added, we, we added some structure around finding, finding the answers here. Um, and what we discussed three weeks ago, uh, this really boils down to um, a, a question of whether we assume that the broader Western interconnection is competitive or not competitive. So we see that as kind of the threshold question. Is, are we going to assume that the broad, that in, in these instances where we may not be binding on, on inner ties um, and we are presumably uh, price converged with the broad, broader WEC, um, are, is that broader WEC assumed to be competitive or uncompetitive. Um, if we assume it is competitive, then we believe our conceptual proposal stands and it wouldn't make sense to mitigate import offers. Um, and that's our design only uh, needs to mitigate supply offers in uncompetitive areas. Uh, if we're converged with a broader uh, WEC, then we would see ourselves as converged with a broader competitive area. Um, however, if we assume it's uncompetitive, uh, what we show in the other considerations portion of the conceptual design proposal is that any measures we alone could take would likely not have uh, positive market outcomes. I think I have some slides on the thoughts here. Okay, so we take that same uh, example that we've been walking through of the California ISO balancing area. Here I say, well, uh, let's say we're only import constrained on the north, but we're no longer import constrained from the from the southeast. Um, this is what I was saying in the previous slide. It's we are converged with a much wider uh, constrained, potentially constrained, uh, potentially uncompetitive constrained area here. Um, so the concept that we're trying to illustrate here is that well, if there actually is this price difference between our area of $300 and outside at, at uh, supplier D of $50 because I have one binding constraint there. There must theoretically exist a broader uh, constrained area. Um, so under this, I think what we discussed in the paper is that you know you could uh, theoretically do a uh, market power mitigation design, uh, uh, you could perform a market power mitigation process here. Um, and the right way to do it would be to evaluate, you know, that follows our design principles, the, the right way to do it would be to evaluate all of the supply and demand mix within this uh, constrained area. And as you can see here, it may include supply offers that are not, there's suppliers that are not offering directly into our market, but are offering into parallel markets outside of our market. Um, so what we wanted to do under, under this circumstance is, is to get to the root of, you know, whether you can consider just the offers from C or whether you need to be uh, import constrained. We, 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 we showed on the previous, uh, previous slide that we would, we'd have to, that the only reason you would consider mitigating, C, you know, supplier C here is if you've assumed that this outside area is uncompetitive or that we are now converged into a, a broader Western uncompetitive area. Um, so let's go with what we wanted to do is go with that assumption. Let's assume things are uncompetitive uh, where C is and C and X uh, are on this diagram. You know, the first uh, measure that we could do, and I think, I forget if we refer to these as half measures in the, in the um, proposal or not, is we could 
mitigate only the internal California ISO supply offers, and that would be, let's assume it's we're converging in a, in a broader uncompetitive area, our area is uncompetitive, and we would then uh, mitigate suppliers offers from suppliers A and supplier uh, B. So, you know, we looked at this and, you know, during the net demand peak hours, which is when we're generally concerned about our market competitiveness, um, demand in California uh, relies heavily on imported energy to supplement its, its internal capability. So if the external, we see that if the external conditions are uncompetitive, as we're presuming in this example, then we would, we would dispatch at least one, under these conditions, we would need to dispatch at least one megawatt from uh, supplier C, which is sitting in this presumed uncompetitive area. The prices, if, if nothing changes here, C, C's prices, the, the offers from C would continue to set the price at $300. So you haven't, you know, doing this first potential mitigation measure doesn't look like it um, changes much here. Eric, I've got to jump in because I, I completely disagree with all this. Uh, the entire presentation or this slide? The, this, this slide and the, and the okay. view here. Uh, so and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but we might as well, you know, get it up right now. Uh, suppose that C is a two megawatt resource. It's my kids drinking Coke and pedaling on a bike. And A and B have 10,000 megawatts and have enormous market power. Does it make any difference what my two kids do and how much sugar I give them in the competitiveness of the market? You could have the WEC being uncompetitive, and the only firms that have the ability to exercise market power could be A and B. And if A and B are the only people that are big enough with low enough load serving obligations that they have an incentive to exercise market power, we could mitigate them and we would solve the entire problem. And there's no need to mitigate the competitive. If, if C is the competitive fringe, if they're a small producer, there's no need to mitigate them in order to address the market power of A and B. So, you know, there's a presumption here that if C is really a big firm that's got thousands of megawatts and no load serving obligations and has an incentive to exercise market power, yes, you need to mitigate them. But if they're a utility that's got mostly its generation needs to meet its own load, it has very little ability to withhold uh, supply and exercise market power, if they're basically the competitive fringe, you don't, it's irrelevant. What will happen is if you mitigate A and B, remember, market power is exercised by withholding output. If output is being withheld by A and B, and everybody else is producing as much as they possibly can to benefit from the high price, when you mitigate the offers of A and B and they increase their output, the prices go down, and the fringe people that are offering at their cost doesn't matter. They were offering at the cost all on. And you can have people, C, X, Y, could all be offering a cost, and you could still have that market be uncompetitive because A and B are not. So there's a, there's, there's a factual issues here about who actually has market power and who needs to be mitigated and who's really just fringe competition. You know, you can hypothesize situations where, yes, you would need to mitigate C, X, and Y, because they have an incentive to exercise market power, but that isn't necessarily the case. That's a particular situation in which they have some, some enough uncommitted supply that they have that incentive. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a fair comment. So I'll just note, that, though, you've um, added another uh, fair assumption or presumption into the example, though, and that is the question of we would need to evaluate, which we didn't do in the conceptual design proposal, if the offers on the outside are coming from pivotal suppliers or from uh, fringe fringe suppliers, so yeah, we, we didn't we didn't look at that. I think you're right. If that actually is a fringe supplier, maybe you could just mitigate A and B. But it, in this example, until you see some evidence that you've got a market power problem of some somebody outside withholding, if, if we really in our analysis and we haven't looked in any of the stuff I've seen looked at anything other than you know, capacity, high offers within the CAISO. So unless there's some reason to believe there's somebody else that's engaged in, you know, market power withholding outside the CAISO, uh, I don't know how much we, we need to focus on our effectiveness and mitigation in that case. Sure. I mean, it would be, you know, ec ec in this case, economic withholding outside, not physically withholding. I would so this think. is Brad. I got a question for Scott. And this, is a, this isn't a rhetorical question. This is a, a an actual, this is a question. So is that pointing towards a, uh, 
a flaw in our current local market power mitigation where, you know, when we mitigate, we, we don't just mitigate the pivotal suppliers, we pivot, we mitigate all of them. So what you're saying is we don't really need to be mitigating all yeah, of them. I just, I don't agree with that policy, never have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely, especially when we think about expanding this to system wide, it's definitely something to think about and to talk through why we do it. Um, and I, yeah, we'll let Perry get off the stage before we get to that though, maybe. Um, Perry, I did have a, a, a clarifying question. Um, so if you go back, so, okay, I, I see this one, and if you can go back to five, or, or uh, I forget which, the, the previous picture, this, no, one before this, okay. So these are very similar circumstances, and I'm trying in my head to understand why they're different. I mean, I think it's because you're, in your mind, you're thinking of the, the paths between D, C, and the CAISO as being the ones that are going to be tested and the other ones are areas that have just modest interties. Right, and modest could just be not 3,000 megawatts, maybe 800 megawatts. Uh-huh, yeah. They also, you also drew a solid line around E and F, and I didn't know if that was just artistic or if there's some kind of other assumption going on there, because in your other picture, you have kind of a dashed line around everybody else. So you're, you're kind of implying here that these guys are isolated, but it's coming off of the, the pricing from your observation that their prices are converged with KISO and not right, the other right. place. Yep. You know, since Palo Verde is part of the, the KISO, how do you distinguish between Palo Verde being import constrained and the EIM? I mean, wouldn't we see the same congestion? Yeah, you should see the same. So both the transfers and the both the transfers and the and the import offers will could fill up that that constraint. This here is just illustrating. There could be the, the other um, there are other import connections which can still exist to allow EIM transfers to flow. But I mean, if, if Palo Verde were separated from congest by congestion between the CAISO in the in RTD or FMM then it would mean that it was congested. There might be other paths, but you can't move power from Palo Verde to the CAISO because we, we, if we see the congestion, it's there. Yeah. So, so let me, so, I, so this, is, this is clarifying. Just, okay. So we still, still have the, the idea that this would only happen if the, those three major inner ties are congested. And um, if one of those three is not congested um, and happens to link to another EIM balancing authority, you would not be doing what it shows on slide um, number four, right? So if, if one of the three inner ties is not, major ones is not congested and connects with E or F, yeah. You would not be mitigating. Right. We would need to see the, so the three e, simultaneously e binding. And, okay. So in e this and example, F must the two. not yeah. be connected. The, B, the BAs that are eligible for this cannot be connected by the, the three major inner ties. Yeah. I think Ben's asking what if, for example, C could still import into F? Then there's sort of a loop, roundabout way that mm. C could send power into the CAISO. But that's why the solid lines are there, maybe. Yeah, th I think that would be represented as an EIM transfer, though not an import into the CAISO area. That's why we look at the, or what we're trying to say here is, well, let's look at the whether the EIM transfers themselves are binding, um, and whether the our import our, our our import scheduling limits are are binding. This is to say, you know, if, if we did design this thing such that everything has to be binding in order for us to consider ourselves import constrained, this whole idea of this goes away because you will see this price separation between us and, and other um, EIM areas. This is a consequence of simplifying the design to say we only want to look at three major inner ties to consider ourselves uh, import constrained. Okay. All right. So in summary, E and F are not connected by those three inner ties to California. Sure. Yeah. And there are some other VAs that could never be in this situation because they are connected by those. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Yeah, Let's go on. It, it, sorry, it does raise this, oh. this prospect then that uh, 
there could be a case where in the EIM, the C to the CAISO is constrained, but if C to, say, F was unconstrained, either in EIM or elsewhere, that the prices actually may not be different between, say, C and the CAISO, even though the import constraint is binding, um, just because of connections elsewhere. Now, I always thought of, you know, sort of this as a, as a weaker some... test than the energy price test, but yeah. maybe I, it's not necessarily. I don't know. I don't know if I follow, but I think that you'd at least have one node that's going to represent the congestion between these two areas. You have one, at least one um, portion of the system that's going to be at the lower price. Okay, so then the other uh, potential mitigation measure um, we talked about in the other consideration section was to potentially mitigate your internal uh, A and B and your import supply offers uh, from, in this example, C, because we don't have um, any authority to mitigate offers from X because they're not offering into our market. So again, the instances we're generally worried about are competitiveness or ones where we rely on uh, heavily rely on our imported energy to supplement internal capability. Um, so even if we go and say, let's, let's first assume I do have a default energy bid to, for, for an importer C that I could mitigate them to. Um, so if, if these conditions out, outside of this area actually are uncompetitive, as we presume in the example, then we would assume that supplier C with uh, one, one alteration to the example based on what Scott said is let's assume there is there exists a pivotal um, supplier out there. Um, then supplier C uh, facing the threat of mitigation would choose instead to sell its power um, to a uh, presumed uncompetitive um, uh, west-wide trading hub. Um, but, but that would Terry, trade. this is again wandering off because suppose C is economically withholding if you mitigate it, it's no longer economic withholding. It doesn't matter whether it sells to, to, to me or Jim or Ben. No, I'm saying he's, he doesn't even come under the threat of being mitigated. Being he leaves the market. Area. If it's being produced, the output's there. It doesn't matter whether he sells it to X or B. Economic withholding means you're not producing the output. So if he's not producing the no, output, no, it, it means that you're world, bidding. You're bidding. <laughs> You're, you're bidding above your bid costs. Is, is that correct? Right. I'm, not, I'm not withholding. You don't, you don't, no, that, no, 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 no. You have withholding. to be economically withholding. You have to have some yeah. output that doesn't clear. If you have some output that doesn't clear, then when you mitigate it, it does clear. No, I'm saying he leaves. Down. He leaves the market under threat of, of Tyson is going to come and mitigate. Is at he produces the output. Yeah, but he doesn't offer it into our market anymore. He, he offers it at the, the West Light Hub. That's the point we're trying to make. No, you're, you're, no. If you if you have the ability to mitigate him, then you mitigate him. And he has to produce the output. Yeah, then he just leaves them. He, he doesn't even come around. He's not even there to now be mitigated. Now you're saying he can economically withhold it. No, but if he's in the market and we mitigate him, he produces the output. I think we're talking past each other. Yeah, he, I think we are. Uh, so, C, if I if I say, hey, you're going to give me an import offer. Okay, Scott, I'm gonna, you're going to give me an import offer. Uh, and, I thought he was and, in the, if, he's, if he's in the EIM, if he's in our market, the, no, no, this is just an importer, uh, import offer at our tie. That's what C is, import offer at our tie coming from mm -hmm. potentially some non-EIM area, okay? I left the EIM out of this okay, example. So if he sells it to someone else, then someone else who did have that power now can sell it into the ISO. And what's going to happen to the prices? Nothing. Stay exactly the same at this potentially uncompetitive no elevated change. price. There's no output change. If he does it, if his output doesn't change, nothing has changed. That's the point. He leaves the market. And I still have no, an uncompetitively high market. price. If he's producing the same amount of out output, the only thing that can that can cause the, the, the change in price is increasing output. So in order to mitigate C, you have to mitigate his output. If he's in the EIM, you can mitigate his offer and and, and have him produce output. So you can talk about mitigation in that context. This is, this is Brad. I think what Scott's saying is, uh, you know, we can't assume that C is necessarily the marginal unit. Say B's setting the price, and so what Scott's saying is, if C economic, if C leaves the market, you're 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 getting that frees up 
you know, say X to offer into the market, and then the, the price is still being set by, uh, you know, you still have the same supply curve, so the price is still being set by B. And so it, it doesn't matter, Scott's saying, it, it doesn't matter what C does because the, the overall supply and the, the combined between the WEC area and the Cal ISO is the same. So let me just try to recap to see if I understand. Supplier C, uh, even though we're threatening to mitigate, still offers in to our market? And supplier C is just an import bid. The, 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 the hypothesis has to be that C has 500,000, has 1,000 megawatts of capacity that it isn't offering into our market or any other market. And that's the, the ability for it to not offer that supply in any market and to leave it, that's the, that's the market power. So if you say you have the ability to mitigate it, you have to have the ability to mitigate and make him sell that output. Because otherwise, if, if output's not changing, of course price, the market price isn't going to change. Okay. Mitigation means mitigating their offer prices so that supply increases. Yeah, if, if I'm supplier C, I'm offering into the case so at $900 because I'm trying to exercise the market power. No, you're, yeah, but you're... I'm you're economically withholding by offering at $900. You're offering in at $900 and you sell 500 and there's 500 you don't clear. That's the economic withholding. It's the 500 megawatts that you didn't clear. So mitigation okay, prices means are going to be 900. making you offer that 500 megawatts that didn't clear at a lower price so that you don't withhold output. Sure, but I, I think in that example, I set prices at $900 and by offering it. You also have pulled some power off the market. And that's why I cleared it at $900, because otherwise we wouldn't need you. If you if you offered it all at 900 but you produced all, all of it, the market clearing price would be lower. It's the, it's the economic withholding. So when you say you have to mitigate, to mitigate in the context of the CAISO means we, we mitigate your offer curve, so you have to reduce the output. I, ultimately, I think you guys are agreeing where you're going, which is that it's very difficult to mitigate. See? Yeah. So that's yeah, why right. he has options. It's, 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 right. Yeah. No, and, no. I mean, if C is a resource in the EIM, you can apply mitigation to for it. an that's hour. What we're talking about right, but but then the next day he doesn't have to be in the EIM. So in that hour you can mitigate him, but uh, there's still this sort of dynamic problem with being able to mitigate these external resources if they're not RA resources. Yeah, I think I think. Perry is saying if we mitigate C, they're going to leave. Scott's disagreeing that the leaving matters, but, but I think Scott's also agreeing, agreeing there's not a need to mitigate C. So I, well, I think we agree on the outcome for C's, different reasons. If C's <laughs> exercising market power and is, is withholding a lot of output, then maybe you need to mitigate them. If they're in the IM and they're offering that in as part of their flexible capacity, we have the ability to mitigate it, right? If they were offering their, their flexible capacity to $1,000, we can mitigate it. Scott, I could draw up another. Uh, well, I was trying to keep this one with, there's, I'm not even talking about EIM here. I'm talking about import offers, non-EIM import offers, into the KISO balancing area at, a, at an intertie scheduling point. So I, I can run another example um, where we bring, we maybe take this one to the next step, and we have, the interplay between EIM, uh, EIM participating resources and, and resources not participating in the EIM that are just simply offering up at our at our intertie. But I think this example is focused on a non-EIM resource offering it in the Kaito area. And Still, so the same thing is, C, if C doesn't withhold the output, if he sells it to, to me and then I sold into the Kaito, he hasn't withheld it. So the withholding is not producing output. It isn't changed by instead of selling it to the CAISO, he sells it to me, and I sell it to the CAISO. You have to change the supply available in the market. Right. So the example is that this area is presumed uncompetitive. So these, these guys know they're going to get their $300, whether they sell it to us or sell it over to a bilateral hub. So it's, it's uncompetitive, right? That's the example. Uncompetitive means someone is economically withholding output. It's uncompetitive Again, because someone in there has yeah. 1,000 megawatts that could be produced but isn't. So the question is, who is that? 
And the only, the only mitigation that's relevant is what we apply to the person who's withholding the output. So if C has 500 megawatts that they're not selling to anybody, they're not offering it in the EIM, they're not offering it in the CAISO, they're not doing anything with it, we can't, yeah, we can't, if we can't mitigate their plant, we can't get at the market power. And if they are, set, if we're talking about the output they are offering to the CAISO, if we mitigate that, they can still sell to me and I can offer it into the CAISO. That that's, doesn't change anything. It, it, the example presumes it's uncompetitive. You're gonna, you could offer to sell it back in the CAISO at an uncompetitively high price, of, such as $300. That's, I mean, but it's, it's I think only, in the end we're saying the same a, thing. It's only a non-competitive price if there's some output being withheld. The, the output that is being produced isn't being economically withheld. It's the competitive price given the output. Yeah, assume C is out to do that. That's a, kind of the example. C is out to exercise market power and can do it. If, if we only, threaten to mitigate. If C is withholding output and the only thing that change can, can defeat that exercise of market power is to mitigate its offers so that it produces more energy. Who they sell it to has no impact because that doesn't change the supply. If you want to mitigate them, and that, that's an argument for why you can't, maybe you can't exercise any mitigation over people. If you don't have an ability to change the amount of output they offer, you can't, you can't, you aren't following mitigation. That's like saying that, you know, if we, if in, in behind the, the CAISO, in, in behind some constraint, if we couldn't mitigate the actual offers of the resource, and make them produce more. We just said, well, you have to sell it to Paul instead of to Scott. That wouldn't do anything. It's the mitigating them so that they have to increase their output. Yeah. I, the, Maybe we'll belabor in something that's so obvious it's going unsaid. But, uh, Okay, and then the third third measure was to potentially mitigate the internal uh, offers and import resource adequacy supply offers. And under um, this one, um, actually, it's measure three, right? So this would be um, yeah, this would be like your forced uh, participation example because they have an RA contract. Um, and we further assume that C has a default energy bid that we could uh, mitigate C2. Um, and we'll also, in this example, I think in the paper, we make the, the favorable uh, assumption that we'll actually have enough um, RA contracted during this time. Um, I mean, without that assumption, you're back to uh, the, the second measure. So if the external conditions are uncompetitive, uh, as we presume here, uh, suppliers A, B, and C uh, would seek the revenues that they expect to gain by exercising spot market market power uh, in their resource adequacy contracts, or give up selling RA altogether. So we would just you would just see a what we're trying to point out is you would just see a shift of the the revenues you seek to gain by exercise, exercising market power would shift in, from the spot market into your RA contracting space. Like I said a couple slides ago, this really boils down to the question of whether you presume um, the broader WEC is competitive or not. Uh, we see that if it is competitive, um, then it wouldn't be appropriate appropriate for us to mitigate unless import constraint unless we are import constrained and that constrained area is found uncompetitive, and that's what our design does. It does not mitigate import supply offers because those offers sitting in a presumably competitive area, cannot exercise market power on demand within the constrained area. Um, and if the Western Air Connection is not competitive, um, what we were trying to uh, show on the previous slide 
and point taken on whether there exists a pivotal supplier outside or if it's all fringe supply. Um, our assumption was that there exists a pivotal supplier outside. Um, and in that circumstance, we would see that any measure that we could take alone would not likely have positive market outcomes. Prices would be exactly um, where they are with or without the, the mitigation. So under, under these circumstances, we would and we, we, we feel it's more the purview of FERC to um, address uncompetitive westwide conditions. Okay, and then we have the last uh, part of this, and I know that you guys, or I think um, uh, Dr. Hobbs is going to talk about it. Uh, the conceptual design proposal has us only uh, uh, applying the system level market power mitigation to the real time market. Um, and there are, the real time market has certain uh, structural limitations that, that we feel make it necessary to apply the mitigation design in the real time market at a minimum. And that is that consumers are paying, in the real time market, consumers are paying for an amount of power determined by our forecast rather than by actually bidding for it. Um, and there's no mechanism for non-physical for a non-physical entity to apply a competitive pricing pressure on physical suppliers uh, in the real-time market. Um, we'd like to start at the real-time market because we're trying to avoid instances of unnecessary or inappropriate mitigation, which may discourage supply and demand participation in the day-ahead market. We want to encourage robust supply and demand participation in our day-ahead market. Um, and these limitations uh, that we feel necessitate applying this to the real-time market uh, don't exist in the day-ahead market. And I know Dr. Hobbs has some more thoughts on, on, on this topic whenever we get to his presentation. I think that's all I have. That's it. Okay, so um, those were just clarifying questions, believe it or not. <laughs> they were. Um, so at this point, open up to more general discussion about this initiative, uh, first see if my colleagues have anything to say or ask at this point generally, and then Okay, so uh, anybody in the room? Hi. Hello, Hello. Uh, you mind going back to, to page nine? At least that would be so for, uh, for the audience uh, listening, Jennifer, oh, you self appreciate This is uh, Parthenel Vacker with uh, PG&E. Well, maybe I'll just jump, just jump to sort of the, the issue. So on, on page nine, you kind of like list sort of two sort of stark examples, or one example is sort of, do we assume there, there's a competitive WEC, and the second one is there's a not competitive WEC? And like, to me, like, at least I'd be interested in sort of the MSC's take on this of, I don't necessarily view the markets in these sort of stark terms, like that you sort of are walking between completely competitive and completely uncompetitive. To me, it's, there's often sort of shades of gray in the middle, and, and the question is sort of where are the pros and cons of applying, applying different types of mitigations when the market might be uncompetitive. But I'd be interested if, in sort of if you all have sort of the same takeaway as the KISO on um, sort of when KISO should mitigate and when not based on sort of the competitiveness of the WEC as a whole. Well, okay, so yeah, there's many layers there. Um, and you know, you're certainly correct that a you know it's not a binary in a, maybe in a pure sense. And one way to think about it is maybe some some of the time there may be market power, and a lot of the rest of the time there's not. Um, that's probably true both locally and in in some broader level. Um, I one of the big distinctions I I think we've we've operated under from the beginning is kind of whether a market could be potentially competitive um, if there's, for example, enough forward procurement that's happening uh, that would that would allow a market to still operate competitively even under tight com conditions versus, uh, I think, you know, it was, it was recognized early on that in a local market power circumstance, forward procurement doesn't really solve that problem if you're basically buying from one or two generators that have all the um, that have the only sources of supply, um, and and so that's that's as much of the distinction is kind of are there 
market conditions in which you can uh, operate in a reasonably competitive manner versus just there's really no structural way around this. And that's been one of the reasons why we focus so much and, and use rather um, kind of strict tests for the local market power condition as opposed to the system conditions. And so I tend to think of, you know, the WEC issue as um, I, uh, the certainly the, the approval of market-based rates in the first place was kind of grounded on a finding that it's potentially competitive um, or workably competitive or whatever FERC language is. Uh, and I do think that if, if the, the operating under that assumption that we should be able to deal with most of these tight conditions absent some kind of structural barrier like import congestion. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. I mean, I have a couple other <laughs> thoughts on this line that I was going to sprinkle in, but. Eric Little from Edison, just a quick question for you. The last slide you concluded that only applying this in real time, and I know we're going to have a discussion about that, but just my first question to fundamentally understand, DMM found 400 some odd hours of structural and competitive markets. The ISO redid that number and came up with 200 something. Were those restricted only to real time hours or were those real time and day ahead? Those were uh, day ahead hours. And it was a different methodology than yeah, what but, we're talking about. But a clarification though, that was, that measurement was sort of a combination of real time and day ahead because we, we used the forecast demand which, uh, you know, that's the demand likely to materialize in real time or thought to, that, that, that we thought was going to be the time we ran the day ahead market, but that's not, that's not the, the demand that cleared the day ahead market or was bid into the day ahead market necessarily. Okay, but the study results did not limit it to real time is what I'm hearing. Thank you. Right. Uh, yeah, if anything, there's kind of more of a day ahead flavor to it, but as Brad was sort of saying, it's kind of hard to, to make that distinction, but it certainly wasn't a test of real time in the sense of maybe where this, this proposal is going. Other comments in the room? And if not, we'll uh, go to the phone lines. We do have one question. Oh. Caller, your line is unmuted. Hey, this is Michelle Kino from the Energy Division. So even though I'm not there, I still have a, a bunch of comments and questions. So if you could not um, disconnect me right after I ask my questions, that would be helpful. So um, as you know, we've been looking at the import bidding behavior, and we see that some imports that are RA, resource adequacy, are bidding $1,000 in April. And in fact, they're bidding $1,000 every single hour, 8760. I'm just having a hard time understanding how that's not physical and or economic withholding. There's no physical resource behind it likely, and they're not bidding it. They're bidding it at a thousand. Well, for it to be fully withholding, I would think that we would have to see them actually accepted into the market and not provide their obligated supply. Right. That's um, physical withholding, but so economic we, withholding, if you're bidding at 1,000 in April, how's that not economic withholding? Since there's no real resource that has a $1,000 bid in April. Well, I think we also have a concern that there is nothing for them to economically withhold, that they're a, they're a sham resource and we're paying RA money for nothing. And okay. so there's okay. a question of is this economic withholding of a resource that actually exists or is there no resource and uh, we're paying yeah. our rain money for it. Right. Is but it I, I guess that's a different issue, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. so the root, of, the root of that problem is sort of what we're buying uh, through the RA channel. Um, okay, I'll get to and, that. Okay, that's fine. So I have another question for you. But, uh, this so, is Brad. I could add back to what Scott was saying earlier. I, I think it's, I, I guess, it is economic withholding if they're, if they're uh, bidding a 1000 and they don't clear because they're not producing. But the point that Scott was making is, if they're a, a fringe supplier, they're not they're not pivotal, so they can't they're not affecting the market. Right. Am I in, putting words in, in your, your mouth, Scott? Sorry. They were a small Sorry. fringe supplier, and the cost were ten. They wouldn't offer the thousand. So the, problem, the, the suspicion is they're not a fringe supplier. They're a they're a phantom supplier. 
Right. They're not doing okay. it for reasons of market power. They're doing it for other reasons. But in any case, they're not affecting the, the price. So they're not, they're well, not pivotal. they set the price, right? Unless they, you know, on a hot, hot day when we're hitting 45 and they do hit, they yep. do cough. Okay. So I've got another question. I, I so guess you that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I okay. guess it's a question of what you, they're withholding from, in a sense. I mean, they're, uh, they sold RA. Um, and they didn't necessarily sell energy, so I don't know if we can say they're withholding from the California energy market if they never committed to actually sell energy in California, except well, at $1,000. Kind of sad argument, but okay. Um, okay, so now I have another question. I think Edison brought this up. So now let's say that you want them to hedge, so they buy, um, they buy a strip, um, it's going to be delivered at Palo Verde. But let's say they pull out of the CAISO internally. Is that not physical withholding? I said I'm going to be doing an import, but I'm really just buying out of CAISO? Can you repeat that uh, just a little bit more slowly? I missed uh, part of that. Okay. Michelle. Sorry. So a load serving entity. So buys they bought a strip. And they, for delivery at Palo Verde, they assume it's an import, but that that really is just being pulled out of the CAISO itself. So there's no supply, there's no withholding there. This Again, this is an RA supplier that's scamming us? Is that no, what no, we're, no. we're uh, saying? Uh, I mean, could, yeah, I guess, we, I guess it is. We're trying to say bring import energy, but it's not really being imported. I mean, it just seems like there are a lot of games that we're trying to keep track of. And so this is a new one. So if I understand it, the scenario is somebody has sold import capacity, but they're instead kind of clearing out their position by buying out of the CAISO no, real-time market they, instead of actually they, importing? Import energy, not capacity. Import energy. So you buy sure, what you think sure. is delivery, but it's really just pulling out of CAISO. Pulling out of CAISO and then being sent back in, or...? Ah, okay. So what, I'm not sure what the issue is. I mean, if they... Well, is that not uh, the holding? We're counting on it to actually be additional to our internal resources, but it's not. Um, uh, I mean, if they, so so if, it, if they were buying from an RA resource in California, and that RA resource is being exported out of California, then that won't that won't happen during conditions of scarcity because that that resource would have had to have offered it to the California markets first. So this could this round trip could only happen um, when uh, with a resource that doesn't have a must offer obligation. This is actually related to Scott's earlier discussion with Perry about resource C, I think. Yeah, and I, I don't know if this is okay. materially different than an internal resource that, that sold energy but then in real time bought energy out of the spot market instead of producing it itself, which it isn't necessarily bad or manipulative if, in fact, the CAISO market is has a bunch of energy that is actually cheaper to provide than what the import would have cost. Okay, I mean, but we're buying it as import to be incremental. So I'm just saying that I, but I, I think I have a problem with this. Okay. Well, so let me I'm, I'm you sure. I think the incremental matters if we're in scarcity conditions and we really need the incremental on top of everything we already have. But if it's a, a situation where yeah. we're not really scarce and the substitution is affordable. So, you know, again, if we're up at $1,000, then I, you know, they would have to be paying a lot to do that right. strategy. Buying at 1000 Okay, well, so I just did so that, 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 that we have rules that if you have an export that's, not supported by a non-RA resource internal to our system, that we, that's the first ones that cut when we get to scarcity events. So we're going to get that thousand, or that, that import coming in because we'll cut the corresponding export first. Okay, well that's good to know. Okay, I have some other things that I wanted to raise. Um, so I, I just want to note that um, during the energy crisis, it wasn't that uh, California was constrained, right? Transmission constraint. Right. Wait, 
you know, I yeah, very, I think, very rarely, I very rarely. Right. I think that's right. Westwide energy shortage, so there's plenty of uh, transmission capacity. Okay, um, so then I um, have a couple of other thoughts. So I just want to say on a um, let's see if I brought all of my questions. Oh, so I just want to note that. Um, so what Jim Bushnell was asking for really is a physical hedge, and I want to note that um, in the CPUC proceeding, we did try to make it um, physical, right? So we said energy, and I just want to note that KAISO itself prefers the $1,000 bid to the actual energy flowing. Um, so it makes it difficult when KAISO is arguing in our proceeding that it should just be a bid when we think the bids are speculative. So it's just, it's a little, it's a, it's a difficult thing to deal with because we'd like it to be physical. Just FYI. I mean, you're saying make it physical and make it a hedge, and we'd like to do so as well. But if the parent uh, no. be damn. Okay. That's my other okay, I, I understand your point. This is Jim. I, just to clarify, I, I did not, I, I would not consider what I've been um, talking about with regards to forward procurement as, as necessarily a physical hedge. I mean, I think a financial hedge at a lower price than $1,000 would achieve, I'd be happy with that um uh cuz of the way the incentive effects and everything goes so i i, I would just I, I i would not consider the physical to be the key area there and it doesn't necessarily have to be through the ra channel instead but there's two ways to hedge right you can do a physical hedge and literally have the resources under contract or you can do the financial hedge and some i mean right i mean what sure, you're trying sure. to do with the financial I'm not hedge saying is replicate the physical well, I, you could argue that a financial hedge would allow more flexibility. But, yeah, I, I, I'm not saying physical hedges are should be banned or are bad. I'm just saying that I wouldn't limit sort of what I think would be useful to just physical hedges. There, there's a distinction okay. between financial hedges for, of the cost of energy and RA capacity. I mean, if, if you're counting on RA capacity, you want that to be physical so that there's a resource there. If you're hedging the cost of energy, that's fine if that's purely financial, but it's better if it's purely financial. Right. I'm just saying we try to make it physical, and we want the energy to flow, and now they're pulling out of California. So that's just hard. That's right? not because making the energy flow all the time is not the same as having a physical resource. What you want is to have a physical yeah. resource that can flow when you need it, not when you don't need it. Right, but not bidding at $1,000. Okay. Um, I have a couple of other comments. So you didn't have zero either. Yeah. Okay, so um, my other my other is just on the overall. I know this is going to go to the board, and I just want to note that the extended day ahead market, the um, benefits were potentially a hundred million, and I know that could go up, but um, that's a hundred million per year. And I just want to note in terms of like things that can go wrong, system market power is not a hundred million dollar problem. It's like potentially hundreds of millions of dollars and potentially billions of dollars. So I just think in terms of like what we spend our time on, I know that extended day ahead market is really important and it will get us, you know, incrementally more efficient dispatch. But I also think that if we overlook the system market power, then it's, it's uh, I think that's a more egregious thing to overlook if, if, um, if uh, in terms of like costs and benefits. So that's my final comment. So thank you. Okay, th thanks, Michelle. So your final, final comment basically about uh, where to put priorities and you're suggesting that um, system market power presents uh, potentially such a, a large dollar risk that it shouldn't be uh, delayed uh, in order well, to pay yeah. attention to the RAM product and other things, okay? Yeah. Because um, I, I, I know there are a lot of stakeholder comments about where, where priority should be. There's a lot on the ISO's plate, so thank you. Right, and I know that EDAM is a priority, but the incremental benefits I'm saying are, are not, um, I, I think, pale in comparison to the potential cost of not getting the, the structure of the, of the market right. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, I just want to check with the operator. Is there anybody uh, else uh, has we, comments at this point? We do have one more. Oh, okay. Caller, oh. your line is muted. Hi, good morning. This is Jeff Spires with PowerX. Uh, I just had a, a couple of thoughts on the presentation so far. Um, first of all, I just wanted to commend Perry and, and the KISO staff for clearly making a, a concerted effort to try to thoroughly understand the data, take the time to understand the underlying conditions that have 
uh, led to high prices in, in some of the hours in question. And um, we do think that the, the conceptual design at a high level has uh, some reasonable principles that could form the basis for potentially a, a workable approach if CAISO ultimately pursues a BA-wide mitigation. But I think um, as we've sort of seen just through the discussion so far, um, the devil's in the details on how that would actually work. And, and so clearly there's a lot of work necessary to try to, to, to flesh out the mechanics of how you would implement this type of concept. And I, I think just talking about priorities and, and that sort of thing, I think the CAISOs and the MSC's previous analyses on um, some of those historical hours have have really provided some valuable insights as far as the high prices that we've seen to date have been uh, relatively infrequent. They've corresponded to periods when there have been tight supply conditions in the CAISO BA and tight market conditions across the West more generally. And they've been occurring during uh, periods of higher and unpredictable gas prices. And just to add to that, uh, after some of those hours have been identified, PowerX did look more closely at what was going on in the external markets and looking at the bilateral prices during those hours and days in question uh, from 2018. And what we saw was when you look at the bilateral prices at Mid-Sea and at Palo Verde for the 16-hour products and you compare that to the CAISO day ahead prices um, on a 16-hour basis, we really did see that there was convergence between the bilateral prices and the CAISO uh, LMPs. And so we've, from our perspective, that reflects a competitive outcome to the extent that CAISO is faced with tight supply and they need to compete with the limited voluntary supply from external resources. And so we we're really seeing that the prices on those days and in those periods reflects that. And so I think, you know, just from our point of view right now, what we're really struggling with is the perspective that this is an urgent issue, that it should be fast-tracked and potentially divert limited time and resources from the other numerous initiatives that are ongoing. And I think the most important one that we really feel needs to be addressed is dealing with the challenges in the RA program because I think clearly that is um, leading, that is the, the critical factor leading to the tight supply conditions in the CAISO BA in the first place. And I would just add that I, I think that the concerns that uh, Michelle had raised around the import uh, rules and the risk of phantom supply is one of the critical issues that should be addressed in the RA enhancements. Um, so we're supportive of pursuing uh, enhancements to try to ensure CAISO has access to real physical supply that's backed by actual physical resources in the RA program. So that's not to say that we don't believe that this is generally uh, an important topic, and, and we certainly recognize that a BA-wide market power issue could be a concern in the future, but uh, we, we just don't see the evidence that this is a, a critical issue at this juncture, and in our view, we would, we would look forward to further discussion on this topic, but we think it would be more appropriate, especially given the, the move towards EDAM, to do that more comprehensively um, by reviewing more broadly price formation. And so that would include looking at addressing the potential for market power, uh, including BA-wide market power, evaluating whether improved scarcity provisions would be appropriate, uh, continuing the, the day ahead market enhancements uh, where we're seeking to more effectively co-optimize capacity and flexibility and other products that the CAISO is ultimately needing to ensure that they can operate their system reliability, reliably. Um, so I think basically we feel like it is an important topic. We support this discussion, um, but we ultimately feel like a comprehensive look at price formation in general is really how we can pursue efficient and accurate price signals, especially in the context of expanding to a regional market, rather than fast-tracking this initiative and focusing exclusively on one single topic. And so uh, I, I know that's a lot, but I'd just be curious to hear the MSC's thoughts and, and feedback on, on those comments. 
So uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, so I think just first of all, uh, just so everybody knows, I think when you talked about the uh, bilateral analysis of the days that, that Scott had looked at, that's the chart on page seven of the comments you just filed uh, that you just submitted um, a couple right. days ago. That's right. Okay. Um, um, all right. Um, just want to make sure I had the right thing. So let me see, first of all, if there's any response. Any members? No, we think it's useful to look at that. We're, we're looking at that as well, and uh, we'll reflect on it. I mean, you're looking at some of those prices. You see that the prices are higher outside the CAISO than in the CAISO, uh, which you could think of as uh, the CAISO's got a more efficient market because it's clearing every hour. You don't have to buy 16-hour blocks, so sellers and bilateral contracts can, you know, you're, you're selling, uh, you're, you're meeting the load with wind in some hours and solar in some hours and maybe running a gas turbine in other hours. So, uh, but it is uh, useful to look at that comparison. And Jeff, this just to, uh, um, I wanted to ask whether um, your results are available elsewhere. I just noticed that the, uh, the chart on, on page seven, that the labels on the x-axis of the 10 days uh, um, truncated, and so we don't know which days are, are which. Uh, is there another place where this analysis is available? It has the full chart or data? Uh, we do have a, a slide deck with a similar chart, and we could, um, we could look at resubmitting with the scale uh, improved as well to make that uh, broadly available. That's not a problem. Okay. All right, thank you. I do, just one quick follow-up to um, what Dr. Harvey just said. I think one of the one of the um, I think conclusions that we would emphasize when looking at this data is just recognizing. I, I fully understand many of the points uh, Dr. Harvey just made about why the prices might be different. But I think what one of the things we would emphasize is that if you're an external resource and you're looking to sell your output on a day-ahead basis, you are making a choice between selling bilaterally, which is most typically in a 16-hour or 8-hour block, versus not making that tra transaction and instead making it available to the CAISO. And so, you know, regardless of why the prices might be different, I think what we're really looking at is what are the expectations for an external seller and are the, the price indicators of um, which market ultimately that supply is going to end up being sold to uh, consistent with a, a market where the CAISO is competing with those other external purchasers for that supply. And so we think that while it's not exact, those, those prices follow together relatively closely that suggest to us that the CAISO's prices are consistent with competing for that external supply that might otherwise be sold to an external purchase on a 16 or 8 hour basis. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, uh, operators or anybody else? Okay. If not, uh, sorry? Sorry, I was saying there are no further questions on the phone. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Perry. Thank you. So um, I have just a very short presentation, and it's just a demonstration of a, a question that bugged me when it was first proposed that um, to have mitigation in just one of the markets rather than in both real time and day ahead, because of course um, local market power mitigation is is, is in both markets, um, and un, under the under the implicit assumption that, that it was necessary. So um, I was wondering, well, is it possible that mitigation in just one of the markets will automatically result in mitigation of market power in the other. So this is just a very simple theoretical demonstration that, yes, that can be the case, but there are some uh, restrictive assumptions. And that, in general, um, I think we can expect that uh, mitigating market power in real time will have an effect on um, 
exercise of market power day ahead, but uh, won't necessarily fully, fully, uh, fully mitigate it if indeed day ahead market power is a problem. So, uh, like most simple models, it's uh, it depends on the assumptions you make, but at least shows the possibility that real time market power mitigation can at least uh, help significantly with day ahead market power. So. Um, on this slide, I summarize the assumptions and uh, then and then the results. So the assumptions I make is that the market power mitigation, first of all, is somehow perfect, that we bring offers all the way down to marginal cost, which of course we don't uh, because of gas price uncertainties and we go to 110 uh, percent, et cetera that there is efficient virtual bidding, and at least one of the stakeholders has questioned that in their comments that were submitted this week. Um, the model is simple, linear supply and demand in both real time and uh, day ahead, and that we have oligopolistic suppliers who are competing with each other basically in terms of quantities, and they naively assume that um, if I change how much I sell, nobody else will change how much they sell, including um, uh, convergence bidders. Other assumptions are, of course, possible. Um, and the, the model results I'll show um, assume that suppliers optimize the day ahead market, not considering the fact that if I sell more in the day ahead market, I have less to sell in the real time market. There's an alternative market uh, model in the appendix to my paper where I relax that assumption. It, it doesn't make a qualitative difference. Um, this is a really important assumption about RUC, that RUC uh, somehow doesn't impact real-time real market prices. Um, and in fact, if you do, uh, if you RUC the right units, then um, you are more likely to be mitigating market power, both in the day ahead and, uh, and the real time market. Um, but uh, as Professor Har excuse me, Dr. Harvey will uh, explain in his presentation, uh, you know, Ruck might simply choose the wrong units altogether. But that's a strong assumption. And finally, there's, uh, I, I don't have any uncertainty here. It wouldn't change the results qualitatively, but um, it would make them richer. Um, so the, my conclusions are is that first of all, it could work. You could mitig by mitigating real-time market power. You, it might be the case that you fully mitigate day-ahead market power, but an, uh, an assumption that would be necessary for that is that the supply in both markets are equally elastic. Um, and of course, in the real-time market, you have fewer generators around, so that uh, might not be the case. Um, the other conclusion is that uh, convergence bidding by itself is not necessarily enough for this result. If the real-time supply is appreciably less elastic than day-ahead supply, real-time um, mitigation will only partially mitigate the day ahead market power. It might mitigate a lot of it. It depends on the relative elasticities. Um, so what happens in that case is that uh, those exercising market power day ahead will encourage uh, convergence bidders to shift load to real time when supply is more costly and as a result prices go up in both uh, day ahead and real time in the presence of day ahead market power. And the real time mitigation doesn't, comp doesn't uh, fully correct that. So in the, I'm just going to show graphically to illustrate the assumptions here. Um, so um, the solid line is the marginal cost, the variable cost of providing supply day ahead and then uh, depending on where you wind up scheduling day ahead, then you can make adjustments along the dash line in real time. You don't have quite as much, many generators online or whatever, so the real time supply is generally less elastic. Um, and that may also be because you can't, can't import uh, quite as much. Um, but you can make different assumptions about that. So uh, this shows, the, uh, the dash line shows the supply of adjustments around the day ahead schedule. And the sim similarly, you can see the same thing. You could make the same assumptions with demand. Um, I allow elastic demand here. You could have perfectly inelastic vertical 
demand, fixed demand in real time if you want, it actually turns out that doesn't make much of a difference in this model. But again, um, the real-time demand is likely to be steeper um, along the point where you are at the point of scheduling day ahead um, is the assumption here. So this shows what, what happens. So a generator, uh, suppliers can decide to sell day ahead um, where it's not mitigated or sell in real time where it is mitigated. Um, the real-time mitigated uh, supply curve follows the dashed line. The day-ahead supply doesn't have to follow the solid line. That's the cost, but the, the, the offers could be considerably higher. And what you get is you get five variables and uh, five equations. The equations are the first-order conditions for what the generators are choosing to do. Um, also, market clearing in both markets. And finally, a no arbitrage condition, assuming that the convergence bidders really are, are efficient. And the solution you get uh, turns out to be at the intersection of the dashed black line, which is the real-time supply, with the demand curve. Um, and uh, under the no arbitrage assumption and no uncertainty, uh, th you get that point right there, which is a little bit higher than what you're going to get in the competitive market, which I'll show in the next slide. So along the x-axis, and you, you can't see the laser pointer if you're calling in from home, um, you have day ahead supply um, equal to 22.2, um, but day ahead demand is equal to 34, so the difference about 12 is provided by virtual supply, which then turns into demand in, in real time. And you provide about 12 of real time generation, which is what ups the price. So let's compare this to the competitive solution. If everybody's a price taker or everybody's mitigated to their marginal cost, you'd be at the green dot which will be a lower price, in this case uh, a buck and a half lower, and slightly more total uh, demand being met, about uh, one and a half more megawatts in, in this case. And the consumers are better off. They're paying less and getting, and getting more. Um, the market powers result in less load being served and also higher costs because we're getting more supply in, of that costly supply in real time. And this, again, is where the ruck assumptions are, are pretty important. Okay, we can also compare this to what happens if you don't do any mitigation whatsoever. This is a solution with one generator. There are also solutions in my memo with multiple uh, competing suppliers. But if you don't mitigate at all, you get a much higher price. Instead of 65 and a half, you get 73. So the real-time mitigation has helped quite a bit, but it hasn't moved us completely to that competitive point. So this is, again, uh, this is showing that real-time mitigation can help, and the analysis shows that um, the, the extent to which the mitigated prices um, come, uh, come to the uh, ideal of the competitive prices depends on the difference in the elasticity between supply in real time and supply day ahead. If the elasticities are exactly the same, if the dashed black line lay on top of the solid black line, then mitigation of day ahead market power would be perfect and real time mitigation is all that we would need. Um, there's some additional results. So there's the, the memo is posted and um, one result of, of not having any uncertainty turns out the real-time demand elasticity doesn't matter. Even if it was vertical, it wouldn't affect things. Under uncertainty, that might be a difference. I haven't explored that. Um, I look at oligopoly with two or more companies, and you get uh, the same results. Identical elasticities of costs. In, in real and uh, time and day ahead result in real-time mitigation working. To the extent that the real-time elasticity is less, the supply curve is more vertical in real time, you get more market power being able to be exercised day ahead. 
the exact amount which depends on the divergence of the elasticity and uh, and then the, all the other assumptions about rock and so forth. Um, uh, and then I also looked at some alternative assumptions about how smart the suppliers are in terms of recognizing the impacts of day ahead decisions upon their real time costs that changes the numbers but not the qualitative results. And I have not modeled this, but I'm conjecturing that if ruck increases the elasticity of real time supply, then the mid the spillover effect of real time mitigation upon day ahead market power should increase. But if RUC commits the wrong units, so those units are, would never be used in real time um, or really increase the costs, then um, th that might be less effective or might be more costly. Um, so at any rate, um, so I feel more assured than I, before I did in this analysis that real time market power mitigation by itself can really help with the ahead. Um, um, uh, mitigation of market power, and that, to me, at least to me, that was somewhat reassuring. So um, it's time for folks to wake up, hopefully refreshed from your nap, um, and see if there are any comments or questions in the room. Yes. Eric Little from Edison, just curious in your assumptions, what did you assume about grid topology between day ahead and real time? Um, so this was gridless, so copper plate. Okay, so if, if that varies, though, now you have problems with what's what the market looks like in those two and the ability for convergence bids to converge those prices and therefore take care of the problem in both markets becomes much more difficult, correct? Abs absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Other comments or questions? Yeah. Well, this is, uh, this is part of that course, PG&E. Uh, maybe it's a, more of a request for the future. I think this is a... Um, a, a good uh, a good start on analysis on sort of what the impact would be of the real-time mitigation. I'd be interested in the future in terms of, you know, the trade-offs in terms of obviously you have a lot of assumptions in there in terms of um, why the market will, yeah, thank you. Um, it, you know, in terms of, you know, perfect virtual bidding, um, no uncertainty, ruck, there's a lot of sort of impacts to it. Part, the part of the decision on whether or not to mitigate only in real-time versus day ahead is that likely there's some cost benefits between the two. And so I'd be interested in the future and sort of your analysis of does it really make sense to mitigate only in real time given sort of the trade-offs that the case has identified with or sort of the, um, some of the cons, for lack of a better term, with mitigating uh, day ahead too. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, that, that comment then is mainly that uh, it'd be useful to look at relaxation some of some of the assumptions in terms of, for example, allowing imperfect virtual bidding or maybe considering the, the grid and saying how does that change the benefits and costs of just going with real time versus both. Yeah. Do and, I understand? And sort of doing an analysis of basically what are sort of the costs and benefits of mitigating day ahead versus real time. Um, and sort of, because at least part of the reason why I think the KAISA was leaning towards the real time only was they saw that those costs, basically the, those trade-offs as basically warranted that the real time only might be sort of the, the best solution. And so I'd be interested in sort of the MSC's opinion on if they agreed that mitigating real time only was um, basically a better option than mitigating both day ahead and real time. <laughs> If it was costless in terms of uh, implementation, you know, complexity, computationally, um, you know, the fact that we think you ought to mitigate both in real time and day ahead and LMPM, uh, to be consistent with that broadly, I think, uh, that, that's an argument for doing both the, uh, in the system as well. Uh, but given that um, there's an awful lot to be done on a number of market initiatives, that it makes some sense to start with one that we think will be largely uh, effective, see how it goes, and then um, uh, and then uh, tackle the rest of it later on if it's if we need to, and uh, we think that it'll work. So it's uh, certainly you could charge and go full bore after both of them now this year, but there's a lot of other things the ISO has to done. So at least my personal opinion, it seems reasonable at least at least to take this one step and learn and learn from that. But it's not necessarily the ultimate thing that should be implemented. 
Ja. Uh, Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, a, a detailed question and then a high-level question. Um, when you're talking about your ROC assumptions and you were talking about um, committing the wrong resources, um, does that include not committing at all sufficiently or over committing? Because the wrong resource seems to imply that, you know, you need 100 megawatts and you pick the wrong resource for that 100 megawatts. And I'm wondering if that includes simply not procuring it or procuring 100 megawatts when you don't need it. I was thinking simply of choosing a different resource than what you would choose if you were going to uh, meet the entire load forecast in, um, um, in the forward market. So that you choose something that's more cost, or you know, something that's cheap to um, commit but would be very expensive to run, you wind up. Um, and when the load actually is, uh, when you actually go to real time, you wind up then incurring more costs than you would have done had you optimized the whole thing together. That's all, that's all that I meant. I didn't think about whether you might have the wrong total amount. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just because Thanks, our, you know, our observations of the market seems like we do overcommit fairly frequently, so that would hmm. be a case I'd be interested in you thinking about. Um, okay, and then a high-level question, and I think you answered it a little bit when you were responding to Partha. Um, I apologize, I missed the beginning of this, but I didn't think you guys had formalized your opinion on it yet, and it sounds like you at least on this, um, on market power mitigation, and it sounds like you at least personally think that real-time mitigation is good, but you're not willing to go to day ahead. But I was wondering, has the MSC come up with an opinion on that? That's still pending, right? We're, we're right. all just talking. I don't know. I, I don't know how my colleagues feel about it. But I, um, this, I was expressing my personal opinion that I am. Um, I understand the, the rationale to try to not to tackle um, a very large um, uh, change in market power mitigation quickly, given the other things the ISO has done. That doesn't necessarily mean this is what we're going to say in the opinion. I don't know how my colleagues colleagues feel about it. Yeah, and so, I think I think we'll probably touch on this again during Scott's presentation. Um, I'll, I'll just throw a couple quick points out that I my you know I, I think another um, angle to part this question is if we did real time only, could it possibly make things worse? Um, I don't know of a market that has two settlements that mitigates only one, but there may be one out there. Uh, so it is a bit of new terrain. Um, I, my own instinct is that it's kind of like what Ben's model shows, that it it will do something, something good, under certain circumstances, but maybe not eliminate all market power. It could be sort of a, a fallback, upper bound, I think intuitively, if we're seeing sort of periodic spikes of market power, system market power, if, if there were any, that um, if they were very periodic and not predictable, we probably wouldn't get a lot of virtual bidding to arbitrage it because it'd be kind of a surprise. Um, so the question is sort of like how predictable is this and how much could we expect demand or any other resource to sort of um, anticipate that and sort of arbitrage into the real time there? How does RA allow that and, and all those sorts of angles? But my, my sense is it would do something, um, not maybe as much mitigation as, as a formal. And I do think there, there are some technical questions surrounding unintended consequences of trying to do it in one market and not both that – um, you know, that we'll have to think through during the stakeholder process. I, um, there are, but there are policy level questions that we haven't really had to confront in the local market power arena that are relevant, very relevant to this, you know, having to do with a bunch of resources that aren't actually must offered into our market that we really kind of would depend upon during certain circumstances and, and what are the implications of, um, of trying to mitigate them, particularly in day ahead. Uh, and, you know, in addition to all the, the standard software implementation sorts of questions where, um, you know, one, one way, is, if it is technically only possible to do real time quickly, then I think we do have to sort of ask, all right, is this, is this definitely sort of an incremental step in the right direction or are there unintended consequences that maybe sort of say, oh, we should think through this until we have sort of a full integrated approach? Nothing else in the room. Operator, do we have anybody 
Okay, um, so at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Scott. Usually we try to break for lunch at noon, but I think we're scheduled at 12.30 here. And uh, Scott is going to give us a lot to chew on. Conclusions in here. I'm trying to talk about some questions and things, uh, issues I think we need to talk about. Uh, and I've grouped it sort of uh, in the three areas, some high-level design issues, some of which maybe are details, but they affect how we think about uh, some of this uh, design and then talk and rehash some of the discussion we had with Perry earlier about import competition and the, the geographic market and then talk about the, the time frame a little bit, going over some of what uh, Ben already talked about, uh, but putting, uh, talking maybe about uh, my views of how some of these, uh, some of the considerations we have to talk about empirically about what is the slope of that, uh, the, the real time versus day ahead uh, supply curve and what, what matters. Uh, so the high level design issues I thought I'd, I'd talk, raise here were first, uh, the, the CAISO has talked about application of market power in real time, but just said real time. And what do we really mean by real time? And I, and I, I think we need to talk about uh, what, what the scope is that we, we have in mind and then talk about uh, ex post market power as, and uh, in real time and the implications of that and then talk a little bit about uh, the testing. So as I, as I as you mentioned, the, the, the CAISO is a little bit silent in the, in the documents about what's this, what does real time mean? And if we, if we have resources that don't clear in the IFM because they were met, that load is met by virtual supply or that load is price capped load and didn't clear in the day ahead market at all, then you've got, you don't have enough resources committed in the day ahead market to, to meet the load. And you're going to schedule resources in RUC to, to meet that load. And if those are long start resources, RUC will uh, make a commitment and, and order them to start. But for other resources, RUC is just giving them a notional, well, we, we've got that resource available, you need to be available, but we're not locking in any prices or offers. Uh, it seems to me, you know, it, uh, we need to think about what, are we going to put a, a, a test for system market power, uh, into stock and RTPD, uh, as well as FMM and RTD to make those uh, commitment decisions based on uh, mitigated offer prices or uh, mi mitigated commitment costs or not. Uh, and my, my thinking is that if, we're, if, we were, if we really w had a problem with significant system market power, uh, that we'd want to apply the mitigation to the commitment costs when we got into these, uh, these processes. But that's something that we, we haven't really talked about. Maybe it's implicit to when the CAISO said real time, but it, it factors into some of our other decisions about and, and how we're analyzing import constraints and others as it, it's a little bit different as we get into the different time frames away from the time frame of the, uh, the EIM real time and into the, uh, the further ahead of the HASP and stuck. And that's part of that gets into some of this distinction about when we're talking about import competition and constraints, the constraints that you see binding when you get into the the 15 minute market and you're actually modeling the EIM constraints might be different from what you're looking at in the stuck five hours out when you're just looking at the uh, the constraints on the uh, the ties. Another distinction I wanted to, to, to bring out is that there, the distinction between ex-ante and ex-post market power. 
and it, we're going to get into it a little bit as we slide into real-time mitigation and day-ahead market power mitigation and a, and, a, and a market design potential in which if there is significant market power, resources are not going to have day-ahead market schedules for their real-time output. Because a, a core function of the, the IFM is basically not to commit everybody all the units all the time. It commits some of the units. It commits the, the, the units that we need to reliably and cost-effectively meet load. So intrinsically, uh, in doing so, it makes a choice of we're not going to have as much competition. We're not going to have as many units online in real time as we're offering in the IFM. And that's just an intrinsic nature of uh, the process, and that's efficient. That we, we don't want to have everybody running in real time. We only want to have the ones we need, which means by definition there were some options we had day ahead, but as the arrow of time moves, we lose some of those options. And you might have been tightly constrained by all the competition day ahead, but when we don't commit, you know, Mo, Curly, and, and Larry, then when you get into real time, there are fewer options. And maybe you, ne you didn't have any market power at all day ahead, but you have it when we get to real time because we just eliminated all the options. And the, the standard market design, the ISO market, takes care of that because the IFM is financially binding. And that's an important part. If you go back to the 90s when we were talking through that, that was an important part of it that it takes care of the ex post market power mitigation problem because the people have financially binding schedules. And if they raise their offers in real time, they're not raising the price that the load pays, they're buying back power at a high price. So it, it takes care of those, those ex post uh, market power problems. The thing we've got to think about is if we don't have an IFM that's clearing to uh, and locking in the price at which customers are, are buying power in the day ahead market, but instead we've got virtual suppliers that are that are meeting that load and uh, load serving entities that are putting in price cap bids based on their expectations, and we've got more supply rolling into real time, we don't have the same process. We don't have the same design in terms of locking in the obligations of uh, all of the resources. Now, the fringe, the suppliers that clear in the day have market, they're going to have IFM schedules. So we're not talking about everybody. We're talking about some amount of supply that doesn't clear in the day head market. And this is a hypothesis. Those are the people that have unmitigated market power. And some of that su supply is going to be replaced with virtual supply. Some of it's not going to be met at all. It's going to be price cap load. But in the end, all of that is load that's going to slide into real time and be met with resources that are available in real time. And we're going to apply mitigate, the CAISOs has a design for applying mitigation to that, to, to, to those offers in real time so that we don't have market power uh, being exercised in terms of economic withholding, but we have to have in mind this context of, but we don't have all the resources that we had day and at. And it is a more limited uh, competitive framework. And that doesn't really undermine anything the CAISOs proposed or the design of real-time litigation, but it, it does have some implications that we need to keep in mind as we talk through uh, what we're going to do. I don't think I need to go through all of this, uh, to, uh, but you know, one, one thing that is important is uh, I want to emphasize we think about is uh, if we're rolling into real-time, those resources into real-time, remember we're mitigating all those offer prices based on real-time default energy bids, which aren't our best default energy bids. Uh, so it's one of the, the things we need to think about is what's the process going to be if we do have resources that roll over into real time uh, to do that mitigation. On the other hand, it all depends on if we have a problem with a lot of market system market power in day ahead and we actually have people rolling over into real time replaced with virtual bids or price cap low. So is there actually going to be a problem is, of course, the, uh, the, the first question. Then turning over to the third topic, and one that I think everybody has taken for granted that we ought to apply the three pivotal supplier tests, but I want to pull back on that and make us think about that a little bit and raise questions. Uh, there are a lot of limitations of the, the three pivotal supplier tests, and I think some of them actually became, may, may become much more important limitations as we roll into uh, the context of system market power instead of just looking behind, uh, behind, behind particular constraints. One of, the prop, one of the limitations of a three pivotal supplier test is that it's uh, basically intrinsically incapable or without, uh, it's very difficult to make take account of 
uh, generator pockets. So you have generator pockets within the market. Uh, they're sometimes within the CAISO, and you count that as fringe supply, but it's not really fringe supply because it can't be dispatched. If we, you know, and we get into the EIM, that's even a bigger issue. I think the discussion that uh, Guermo's going to uh, give us later today, talking about the amount of flexible capacity that's not dispatchable, gives you uh, an idea of how, how big an impact it can be. If 50% of the, the flexible ramp up capacity actually couldn't be dispatched, if we were doing a pivotal supplier test on that, we would have counted all that as dispatchable, but in fact, 50% of it wasn't there. And that's you know what the uh, what his historical analysis shows. So that's a, a non-trivial uh, issue if we get out of uh, a, you know an area where there are potentially more generation pockets. Another limitation is it doesn't take account of the cost effectiveness of fringe supply. And that's just it just becomes incredibly complicated to try to do that. So it's not like it's uh, we made some mistake. It's just an inherent uh, limitation of trying to use the three pivotal supplier method to uh, to analyze competition. And again, this could become more important in a future uh, CAISO and in a future e Western EIM where there are more diverse resources, energy limited resources that are being used, and need to only be used when they're needed to, to balance intermittent resource output, but some of them may be uh, pretty high cost. So if you count them as being uh, available to constrain prices all the time, it isn't really realistic. Now we compensate for that in the design in, in, with our local market power of saying, okay, because we've got these issues with the, 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 the pivotal supplier test, instead of using a one or a one and a half pivotal supplier test to, to, uh, to figure out what, how much competition there is, we use a three pivotal supplier test, which removes a huge amount of output from the market. Now we've got to think about, okay, that's fine when we're doing it behind the constraints, but what's that going to do when we start applying that to the, 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 the whole market and take out uh, all the, the supply of three people and how often are we just going to, is that going to always trigger mitigation even when there's not the slightest potential for, for system market power? And if we start applying this outside the CAISO, that's going to start making it really important how we define what a, you know, what the supply is. Are, and are, are we including load serving entities that uh, have several thousand megawatts of supply, but all but 100 megawatts need to, are needed to meet their load? And we count that as all being withheld. And withhold, withdraw from the, the overall market, the, the supply of the three largest utilities in the West. Uh, you know, we have to, this is going to be important. The fact that this is a very, very restrictive test, it's going to be very important to deal with some of these other issues to avoid just uh, spuriously triggering it all the time. Another fact, key characteristic of the supplier test that maybe isn't uh, completely inherent, but it is a, a characteristic is that it removes all the supply, including the price-taking supply or the supplier that's being tested for pivotality. And that might not matter much in the CAISO because we don't apply it to the, the load-serving entities that are net buyers, but it could start being really important if we started applying it to entities outside the, the CAISO and we don't somehow screen out the load-serving buyers. We start tr you know, triggering mitigation because all of, we're going to assume that all the wind and solar output of, of some utilities would be withheld from, withheld from the market. So we wouldn't want to do that because it would potentially be triggering uh, mitigation when there's absolutely not the slightest uh, possibility of that happening. And that you know, goes into the point on the top of this next slide, that this fundamental issue of we, we're going to need to, if we apply it outside California, we're going to have to worry a lot about how we, who we apply it to, whose output is withheld. We, we right now have an exclusion for net buyers we're going to have to think about how we how we treat that for entities outside the, the CAISO if we apply it. Because if you're a, if you have 5,000 megawatts of load and you're a net buyer of 50 megawatts, it isn't it isn't sensible to say, well, they're going to withhold you know all 5,000 megawatts of supply from the market and therefore fail the pivotal supplier test. They still have to meet their native load. So we're going to need a more complicated. If we apply this outside the CAISO, we're going to have to develop a much more realistic and appropriate method to account for. Uh, load-serving entities. We probably ought to also think about triggering it only when the, the price level is above some threshold, so we're not triggering mitigation of energy-limited resources when the prices are low. So if we, if we get down this road where we feel uh, that we need to, we've got a system market power problem that we need to address, and we're thinking about making significant changes, 
I think these are some of the things that we need to think about. You know, are we going to address these challenges by, you know, fiddling around with the aspects of the pivotal supplier test or going to other tests? So that's one of the choices that we, we need to have on our mind, I think, as we go down this road and we think about how big an effort is this going to be and should we make a, a simple change now but maybe a more complicated change later if we see that we got a bigger problem and we think about, you know, could this do harm or could it do no harm? So those are the, the thoughts I had on the, the high-level design issue. So I've rambled on a little bit on the high-level design issue, so why don't I stop now and uh, see if there are questions in the room and questions on the phone before I move into the next set. Yeah, Scott, uh, this is Jim. I wanted to just um, flesh out a couple of these these issues as well. Um, so I think two of the things you've raised in the last set of slides, uh, I would characterize as sort of the question of, of what the you know the trigger test is: three pivotal supplier versus versus something else, um, and also sort of related to that is the idea of net of uh, net buyer, net seller, and exactly how we define it and whether there's sort of more of a continuum than a binary that could be used there. Um, so I, I, taking that second thing about net buyer, net seller, one of the things you, you kind of raised is that in, in the real-time market, uh, what you're net of is really your day-ahead schedule. Um, and it does sort of raise the interesting prospect of, especially if we're mitigating in real time, um, whether the net buyer should be basically rel at the schedule coordinator level relative to the day ahead schedule um, and whether that could just sort of be dynamically sort of uh, uh, evaluated. Um, you, know, you know, I was thinking that for our EIM entities, if we were applying it to the EIM, they do a base schedule. Right. So we could use, you know, apply it to uh, their, their base schedule if they can withhold any excess over their base schedule. Yeah, and so I, I do think that's something we, we definitely will want to, um, you know, explore. I think it is easier for a vertically integrated regulated utility because they have load, it's their load, <laughs> and, um, and it, it gets more nuanced for, for positions inside of California. But I think, you know, from any economic model, it's, it's important. Uh, I think another maybe related or maybe distinct issue, you know, back to the three pivotal supplier and, and something we touched on earlier, which is we're mitigating everybody when the test fails. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually forget the logic behind that now, but I think one argument in favor of that is, is if you had, say, you know, six generators and uh, they were all roughly equally sized, then any combination of the six could be jointly three pivotal, but we don't have time to sort of go through all the combinatorics of that, perhaps. Um, and so to try to deal with those situations, we just kind of say, okay, this is problematic, and therefore we're not going to look for number four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, but I, I, it does raise the question of whether there might be some threshold below which we're, we're pretty sure somebody is not pivotal. Uh, under various scenarios, if we're going to go that route at all. Yeah, and actually, um, it's easy to do that test because all you need to do is once you know what the two largest are, you know that you know anybody larger than X is going to fail, and anybody smaller is going to fa pass. So you don't actually have to go through all the, the combinations. You just you know do calculate the two biggest, and you know what the answer, and compare it to your your relief, and you know what the answer is. Uh, so you could, and, and TGM actually implements it that way. So it's not unimplementable. Uh, and it's, yeah, and I think it would be, again, if we're doing this, well, we don't quite know, but if we're doing it more often and certainly to more units, because we would be basically talking about every unit in California under a system market power mitigation, is that, um, is that where we want to be? Um, you know, this has been rattling on the back of my mind when we've been talking about mitigating battery bids, which is really hard, and, and do we need to do it? Uh, what are the implications of all of that? Um, yeah, the more, the more we have more, you know, lots of, you know, we get small energy limited resources that aren't owned by a big supplier. Do we want to create agony for us by mitigating every time the, the two or three biggest suppliers get mitigated? Yeah. Yep. Yep. This is Partha uh, from pg and &E again. Uh, thanks for this discussion. I really think this is a uh, yeah, very uh, very informative. Uh, I 
maybe I'll sort of set some of the context. I really think the U.S. sort of really good questions that the ISO would need to address just in terms of, you know, at least I, to me there's probably three that it seems like we're really touching on. And it was, the first is sort of when is the market uncompetitive and who has market power? That kind of ties into sort of who should we mitigate? There's been a good discussion on internal only. Should we only mitigate pivotal suppliers? Um, and then there's sort of a big point on sort of when should we mitigate day ahead versus real time? And so really going on this is I think there's sort of a, a fourth point that I'd be interested in you discussing on is sort of what level should we mitigate to and what are the trade-offs between those? It seems to me like there's, you know, if, if, in, if for example, if we had a fairly large adder, you know, like, you know, it's one thing if you said we ate two DEBs, we're going to do DEB plus 10%. But it would be another thing if we said, well, let's just say DEB and 25%. Well, it might be the case where this really does cover um, the incremental cost in 99.9% .9 of the circumstances. Um, and it might need to be different for gas versus for use limited resources. So I mean, to me, that's part of the trade off I'd imagine is if we had. You know, given sort of the challenges on sort of identifying the level of market competitiveness and when we should mitigate, it might be the case where we want to be sort of, for lack of a term, a little more um, liberal and mitigating, but allow a, a little bigger of an adder given the fact that there is sort of some uncertainty on these. And so I'd be interested in your, your thoughts on, on sort of if, uh, if you agree with sort of those trade offs in the, in the same way I'm thinking about them. Yeah, that is an interesting. Uh... Uh, thought, and it is something I think we ought to consider. Your good point. We should have uh, covered it, and we need to to think more about it. Uh, and there there is some uh, history and precedent for that because if you go back to the the actual origins of the, the AMP in New York in uh, 2000, the automated mitigation, it was actually designed to just the reason why it has like a 300 percent threshold and 100 dollars and all those very high numbers was it was only intended to apply to very unusual circumstances uh, in which uh, there was an unexpected uh, situation that produced uh, maybe not even market power maybe, or ex, more ex, uh, post market power because uh, uh, of events that happened in the market. And uh, there was something that happened there where a, a, a large buyer won a Darwin Award and had a big impact on the, on, the, on the market, and it wasn't necessarily market power, but people were thinking, well, suppose someone else got, did something equally stupid, and, or the, the possibility of that would cause people to leave out high bids. So we don't really care about when it goes up 50 or or $100 once every three years when somebody does something like this, but we do care if it goes from 150 to $900. So maybe we should have a real high threshold or when something really odd happens, that uh, and it, it eliminates the incentive of people to to offer high, so they strike rich in those uh, those scenarios. Of course, Edison appealed it, and uh, the whole thing got thrown out by the courts. But uh... this is Kelly Wells with WPTF. So you had uh, briefly mentioned conduct and impact test. Um, if we consider a design like that, would they have? Would that design have similar issues that we'd have to work through, or is that kind of is the main question? What is that threshold level? It, it, it solves some of these problems, and others it doesn't. It, it addresses, by definition, the generation load pocket issue because it does an actual dispatch. So when resources can't be dispatched, they can't be dispatched. So it it solves that completely. But also, because it actually does a dispatch and the results are based on the price impact, if you have a whole bunch of resources that are incredibly effective and don't constrain the exercise of market power, you see that. Because they don't constrain the exercise of market power and you get a big price increase. On the other hand, if it's, if it's a bunch of small resources that are being withheld or then it has no impact on the market, you see no impact. And if you've got price-taking schedules, well, price-taking schedules are price-taking schedules. You're not going to trigger mitigation on the premise that someone is going to withhold their solar because the solar was bid in at zero. So some of these issues it addresses and some of them it doesn't. But that's why I, I think we've got to raise it because depending on how important some of these issues are going to be and what other way we have to address it, it you know, pivotal support, a, a conduct and intact test is designed to, to get directly at some of those. But it doesn't deal with the collateral damage issue. You know, it's still because you can't apply a conduct and impact test to, to every single market participant. 
you've got to have some carve out because otherwise you're going if when it, when somebody fa when an area fails to conduct an impact test everybody fails so if you want to exempt the fringe suppliers you still have to have a rule to exempt the the fringe supply it it does also help with this this issue of uh economic withholding, we bid up to the step of the next generator, and if those steps get to be really big, that, that could matter, which I'm not sure if that's the gen pocket issue or it's a slightly different one, but. Uh, or the offering high, but you're, yeah. you know, you're, you're there, but it's offered high. Yeah. And I guess the inverse question would be, does it have other issues that a three pivotal supplier test does not have that we'd have to think about? Yeah, it's, you know, the thing is there is no actual test of how large the suppliers are. It just looks at what's the effect of the inflated offers on prices. So that's the, you know, the negative of it. There isn't that link to, to somebody being large, but sometimes there isn't that link in the pivotal supplier test if it's just solar that we're, we're taking as, you know, and that's going to, as the, as the entities we're potentially applying mitigation to change, that's why I think it's a logical point to, to think about how we're going to deal with that in terms of the test. Uh, changing the pivotal supplier test or changing the test, and maybe we should be thinking about something other than either the conduct and impact or the pivotal supplier, but that's a bigger leap because if we come up with something else, we're going to have to think it through. But all those choices and the more changes you want to make, the more time, you know, that, that's time to think through uh, how it needs to be done. I think um, th there's also this issue about exactly how conduct is defined. I'm not sure if it, at one point, I, I haven't followed AMP in a while, but at one point there was sort of a reference bid based on bids during certain hours that were deemed to be competitive, and that would define sort of the threshold for what would be un, uh, unacceptable or, or that would fail the conduct test. And, and I believe in other places it's based upon more like a DEB concept where there's an administrative estimate of what your your energy costs are and, and conduct would be defined on deviations from that. Um, yeah, that's completely, so you can use any approach for defining the reference prices you want. That's a completely independent choice. You could use the same DEBs that the Kaiser uses today uh, to trigger the conduct test. That's, uh, and different ISOs have different, you know, degrees they follow that path for different kinds of resources. Should we check the phones? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and talk about import competition then a little bit. And this is the you know the fundamental question we've been talking about this morning of uh, when to one extent should we use import competition to trigger market power, or should we trigger a system market power test all the time? So uh, one you know and this kind of depends. I was thinking when I was talking about this, I'm kind of thinking about in the, the context before we get into the the FMM and RTD. So when we're actually looking at ties, if we're if we're in stuck and we're applying mitigation four hours out and committing units, and we're trying to evaluate uh, what are the options, we aren't necessarily solving. We aren't solving the full network model. We don't have. We're not dispatching all the generation in the WEC, so we don't see uh, the the EIM constraints. So if we're that far out and we don't really know all the constraints that might be binding. Uh, that's the context in which maybe you would just trigger it based on uh, a, a few of the major constraints being uh, constrained or not. And yes, there might be some of the smaller paths that wouldn't be constrained, but without knowing what other constraints are, you might say who, how much power can get to those places, how much uh, competition do they provide. Uh, so that would be a reason to uh, to look to the major constraints. The to follow up on the discussion that I had with Perry, and this is, you know, going over that ground, but conventional models of market power, the exercise of market power, have a, you know, have a common thread that it's not the fringe suppliers that are, that actually hold their output to raise prices. It's the entities that have a lot of output because the, the premise is that by not, with, by withholding some of your output from the market and foregoing making money on that, you raise the price at which you sell the other output. So in order to be able to withhold some output, have some of that replaced by other suppliers, and still make money on the amount to, on the, the other out, the other output you sell, you have to have a fair amount of output because you need to have some that you withhold from the market, some that gets withheld but replaced by the output of others, and then some that you benefit on. And uh, so the, the the premise is that we're looking at the the output of 
uh, of, of the, the withholding by, by large suppliers, not fringe suppliers. So when we get to the context of who do we need to actually be able to mitigate, we don't need to actually have the ability, if we're looking at some people outside the CAISO that we don't have the ability to mitigate, that doesn't necessarily mean that the mitigation scheme is going to fail. If the people that have market power that really have the supply that they're going to withhold because they don't have load serving obligations and because they can benefit, they haven't sold it forward, they can benefit by withholding their output. If those people are in the CAISO, then they're the people we need to mitigate. And we don't need to lie awake at night that there's Paul who's got five megawatts up in Montana and we, don't, we can't mitigate him because that isn't Paul with five megawatts in Montana isn't going to drive up the price in Kaiso to a material extent. And as Bartha was saying, that isn't the guy that's going to drive it up by a whole lot. So I'm not, I don't share some of the Kaiso's concerns that, you know, just because you can't mitigate everybody in, in the WEC, that means that the mitigation scheme will fail. There is this question of where is the market power problem? Who are the people that potentially have the ability to withhold a significant amount of output to drive prices up by enough that we care? that it's worth all this effort. If those people are within the CAISO, or if at least we don't know of anybody else that, that outside the CAISO that does, and there's a reason to believe that we might, there might not be because those people are mostly vertically and public, public, public entities that have their own load serving obligations, then maybe we can just mitigate the people inside the CAISO. So this is that example that we, we, you know, we beat over it uh, before, but if A and B, are unintegrated merchant generators that have lots of supply that hasn't been sold forward, and C, X, and Y are dudes with five megawatts or utilities that almost all their generation is needed to meet their native load. We don't need to give up and say that market power mitigation can't be effective if we can't mitigate C, X, and Y. If A and B are the problem, then that's all we need to mitigate. So we need to understand, you know, what is the problem and that goes back to, you know, do we have a market system market power problem and who is the source of the market power problem? At least are the people that we think can withhold market power and withhold output located within the CAISO balancing area or not? And if they're in the balancing area, we got them. At least that's, you know, my way of thinking until I hear something, some other uh, uh, way of uh, looking at that problem. So I, I, I don't share all the CAISO's concerns about uh, whether or not we have to have uh, the ability to impose uh, west-wide mitigation. And the top, the top bullet here on this is, you know, it's, it's even possible that the, you know, that the, you could have no, if we really had west-wide market power, suppose it really is, there is market power in the WEC, it still could be the case that the people that have it are located within the CAISO. That if every, you add up everybody else in the WEC, none of them have the incentive to withhold output because their capacity isn't that much larger than their load serving obligations. And actually they'd lose if, you know, they tried to withhold output and drove the price up and lost a unit, they'd be in trouble. So they don't, you know, it's, but so if we, if the problem is in the CAISO, even if it's a WEC wide market, Applying mitigation in the, in the CAISO could be sufficient, and we don't necessarily need to expand the scope of this mitigation broader than that. At this point, you know, we haven't really seen any analysis by DMM or anybody else suggesting that there's a market power problem in withholding by anybody outside the CAISO. Even if we take everything that's been done at, at face value and say it's completely accurate, there's nothing wrong with any of it, we don't have any, we don't have any indication that there's a problem that we need to reach outside the CAISO to address. Put the question on the phone. Okay. Tegan, can you put the question through, please? Uh, hi, this is Doug Bocignone from Flynn Resource Consultants. I just had a couple of points I wanted to make about the import competition issue. Um, one is that it, it seems like we don't need to rely on, or it would be a, a problem if we required that the inner tie, multiple inner ties be constrained before we applied mitigation within the CAISO. Um, because it seems like we could have a situation where there, there people aren't bidding in to the CAISO at the ties, but there's, you know, so there's less supply coming in and, and th that could exacerbate the ability of the 
internal resources to exercise market power. Yeah, I, I, I agree that that's a question, uh, Doug. That's why I'm kind of highlighting this, 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 this point here. There are two ways of looking at the potential for, for market power. One is that we, we only have a market power problem when the CAISO is constrained, import constrained, and that the, there's lots of supply, there's plenty of supply outside the, the CAISO, but it can't get in because we're import constrained and therefore, uh, suppliers that really aren't that big relative to the rest of the WEC, they're big relative to California, so they have the incentive to withhold output and uh, drive up prices. But you, as I indicate okay. here, you could also have a situation where those suppliers are so big relative to the entire WEC that they can profitably withhold supply even when we're not constrained, and even when all the supply in the rest of the WEC is available to, to meet load, they still have so much capacity that they can make money by doing it. So that's, that's a possibility. I'm trying to indicate you don't know which is the case, but there is there is an order of magnitude difference in believing someone has enough market power to behind a constraint where we can look at all the resources and and know what's available, as opposed to saying they've got market power in the rest in the entire uh, WEC, and uh, that the people saw these prices. There's no uh, way that they that the rest of the WEC doesn't have enough supply to, to make up the difference. But that is, a, that is a possibility, and I'm, I was trying to frame things broad enough to cover both of those possibilities. Scott, would you agree that it's very hard to test for that possibility, that A and B, the local generators, are in fact pivotal for the entire WEC? Yeah, it's, it's, it's always hard to, to, to analyze market power and, and who, who has it, but you know, we, we could look at the, the relative size of who are the biggest generators in, in the CAISO that potentially would have the incentive to exercise market power and look at them relative to the WEC, relative to the amount of flexible capacity we clear in uh, the EIM outside, because all we know that's available. And uh, so what, what, what is the relative magnitude of this? Uh, so yeah, I think it's hard, like most market power analysis, it's hard to, to to be real granular, but maybe we can get a sense of whether it's a close call or not a close call. Scott, can, Scott, this is Brad Cooper, I got yep. a question. Would you consider, you know, so we've talked about being import constrained when the uh, ties reach their mm -hmm. capacity, their scheduling limit, or we clear bids up to their capacity, but could it, uh, another condition that could be considered import constrained is when you, when you run all out of the bids on the ties, on the ties, even if it's not up to the ties capacity, does that result in the same Yeah, I mean, thing? that would be the situation where there's the withholding is so large relative to all those excess, all the supply available in the WEC that nothing's available. And, you know, we could actually, you know, we could look at that. How often does it happen that we dispatch all the flexible capacity in the EIM and there's none left? Because if, if the prices were high in real time in the CAISO, we should see all the flexible capacity outside the CAISO dispatched and replaced with and backed down the, the high cost generation within the CAISO. So do we ever see that happening? Uh, so Brad, I don't think it's correct to call that import constrained, but it's sort of the case Scott's been talking about where in essence there, there's WEC wide market power and it's the California generators who are pivotal in that scenario. Is it WEC wide? What if it's just WEC wide scarcity and there's well then there's no yeah then there's not withholding but the, the question but if the question would be are the is have we tapped out the rest of the WEC and we have 2,000 megawatts of undispatched generation in California because the, the, the A and B that have market power are withholding their output and there's no transmission congestion everywhere anywhere the system is completely unconstrained but they've withheld output and driven the price up, and that we're tapped out. We've seen all the, all the flexible rent capacity in the, in the EIM has been dispatched up for energy. All the flexible capacity has been carried on high cost generation within CAISO, and it looks like market power being exercised by the people in the CAISO, as opposed to we've still got 500 megawatts of flexible capacity scattered around the rest of the, the EIM, so it, look, look, we know that there's other supply that we could pull in, 
We may know that there's other supply that people would offer in if they thought the price was high enough. I, I guess, you know, we can do that test for the EIM, but mm -hmm. <laughs> doing right. it for the non-EIM yeah. is, that's the part that... Uh, I mean, I think, uh, I don't know, but I, I think there is some information about uh, what's going on in bilateral trades during these days. If we're looking back at historical days, we could look and see what kind of bilateral trading was going on in those hours. Not, not in the day ahead, but I gather there's some real-time trading on ice that we could look at and see was, was there still supply being bought and sold. Hey, can, can I but, you know, ask you a follow-up? Just start finalizing. Is that Doug? Go ahead. Yeah, this is Doug. So related to that, with the expansion of the, or the extension of the EIM to the day-ahead market, it seems like there will be a lot more visibility than the ISO has now. Um, but the EIM is voluntary. So, and, you know, essentially voluntarily on an interval basis. So, you know, does that present potential problems? And then just the second related issue is, it seems like part of the concern about mitigation, whether we're in a scarcity situation or, or people are just withholding, seems like there's, the, I, I sense a concern about mitigating when you don't need to mitigate, but it, aren't, isn't it really the concern is that the mitigation the level to which you're mitigating isn't properly or accurately reflecting marginal costs. Because if you're mitigating perfectly to the generator's marginal costs, then it seems like you're going to get the, the correct outcome. So should we be focusing right. more on how do we get Always better about mitigation about estimates? Right. It's always a matter of the inability to get all the estimates of costs right. And as we get more and more diverse resources and more and more hydro and the rest of the EIM, no matter how hard we try, we can only hope to get it roughly right part of the time. And the more often we mitigate when there isn't the slightest possible chance of market power mitigation, the more likely we're going to screw up somebody's hydro uh, opportunity costs, and the more likely that they're going to do just what you said, they're only going to offer the minimum. So that's why, you know, you can actually create market power in California if you drive supply out of the EIM by, by creating the risk of mitigating it when there's no problem. So by limiting the, the mitigation to when there really is a problem, you give people more incentive to offer more supply in the EIM. And right now they have to offer their flexible capacity. So we, all, we always know we should see that. And we can see whether it's being dispatched or whether it's constrained down or whether it's being used to replace the output of uh, high-cost California generation. So we got that visibility. And I think you're right, Doug. We want to make sure that we create an overall mitigation framework that incents people to keep the extra supply offered in the EIM and not pull it down to the minimum. Thanks. Appreciate that. Sure. Are there others on the phone? Okay, I think we've sort of talked uh, through these uh, issues here. And let's switch on to uh, the time frame for mitigation, which uh, Ben already talked about. And uh, so I'll go over a lot of this uh, quickly. Uh, but, you know, the, the general framework is that we'd uh, still have local power mitigation in the day ahead market. Uh, there would be, we'd still have, at least for the time being, the 25% commitment cost uh, cap, the hard cap. And my, I think we have to extend this then to, to commitment cost in stock, although that's something that needs to be talked through in the stakeholder process. Uh, we know, as, as Ben said, that in the end we apply mitigation to all these processes because that's best, but there are there are trade-offs in terms of resources and what it takes to, to build this into all the markets if it's hardly ever going to be applied. So that's, uh, uh, you know, a trade-off. And I think at least if we're going to apply it in one market, it's much more important to apply it in real time than to apply it in day ahead and not apply it in real time uh, because it would be too easy to circum completely circumvent mitigation that was only applied in day ahead and not in real time because ultimately withholding uh, is in the real-time market. Uh, and the, the KISO has talked about a number of factors, and Ben talked about them, uh, things that can mitigate the exercise of uh, market power in the day ahead market in terms of price cap load, uh, virtual supply, and all these factors, and I agree with them. 
we, we do need to keep in mind some of the frictions that, that you know, lie behind Ben's discussion of what's the elasticity. Uh, you know, virtual suppliers will come in and offers to cap prices, but they're going to uh, incur costs in doing that. They're going to need to make a margin to recover just the cost of forecasting prices, their collateral costs on them, their the costs of uh, uplift costs we allocate, uh, allocate to them, and there's the uh, the cost of uh, being wrong and the risk. So that's uh, they're not going to do it for free, just like we see high cost virtual supply bids in the uh, day ahead market today. We're not going to necessarily see uh, you know right down at the offers at the dip. You know they're they're going to be somewhat higher, although maybe they're going to be as high as the the cap part that would suggest. I don't. We'll have to think about that. And then similarly, price gap to load offers aren't going to be down at the deb, but they're, they're going to be some allowance for, for risk and uncertainty about what's going to happen. Uh, the other thing we have to be conscious of, and is why I think commitment cost mitigation is important to think about, is that if, if I had market power and uh, uh, really true had, had that market power, and you're going to mitigate me in real time, but I got a long start unit, I'd offer that long start unit in real expensive. And then you'd have to, uh, you could commit me and you could mitigate my incremental offer, incremental energy offers in, in real time, but uh, you'd have to make me whole on that great big high uh, commitment cost offer. Now, to a considerable extent, that's choked off by the KISO design because we have a 25% uh, cap on uh, commitment costs, only 25% over DEB. So we need to keep that in mind. That's an important part of this design as we go forward. And as we move, change that and make other changes, we have to be conscious of, but maybe by the time we'd be raising the cap on the DEB, we'd be uh, moving, either deciding we don't need this mitigation or moving to something more complete. The, the other thing we have to keep in mind is uh, about this is we have to keep the overall efficiency of the process. Now, probably all the fringe supply, and if there's no, hardly anybody ever getting mitigated, this isn't going to matter because everybody's going to be in the, the IFM. But if we started to have people that are exercising uh, system market power, and we did have a, 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 an outcome in which we had price cap load clearing and we had uh, virtual supply clearing, we would then shift into a world, as Ben said, where we're committing resources in RUC. So we've replaced one of the efficiency consequences, was we're now making these commitment decisions in the RUC process instead of the IFM process. The resources we're committing don't have financial schedules. We've just given them a, a commitment to the hire of uh, their as-bid costs or their real-time revenues. Uh, and the, the RUC objective function is, is not intended to necessarily minimize, uh, you know, take over the responsibility for minimizing the cost of meeting load. It's a reliability objective function. So we need to meet, you know, keep in mind that if we get into a world in which we are applying this mitigation in real time and we're seeing the, the exercise of market power in the day ahead markets, seeing a lot of supply and load slide into, the, into real time, that isn't the most efficient framework. But of course, if it doesn't happen, there's no cost. It's something you could wait and see if that's happening and, and decide that we need to, to move into more complete mitigation in the day ahead market. So that's one of the fundamental challenges. How much you need depends on whether this is a problem we're actually going to have or not have. So that's the, uh, the end of my comments. Should we, any more comments in the room? Questions? Jim? Yeah, I was waiting to see if anybody else had anything to say. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to reinforce a couple things you, you covered. Um, one of which is this, you know, this point about real-time mitigation has this, I, you call it ex post mitigation, but it's it, it, it's this phenomena where, by design, we are committing resources and positioning them so that we don't have excess supply. <laughs> we have exactly what we think we need. And uh, it's not that there isn't the potential for competition if we had dispatched a different way. It's just by the time we get to real time, that's sort of the state of affairs. And so that implies that we, and I think this is true, that we're mitigating in real time more than in the day ahead market because sort of by design there's just less supply available to contest um, uh, at any given interval and we have to sort of think about what what that means really uh, in terms of uh, what our goals are for mitigating in, in, in that context. 
Um, and then I, I was going to just flesh out the, your answer to Doug. Um, there's a, I, which I would more or less agree with. The, the, the big issue here is that if we're mitigating um, at least internal resources to levels that are above their marginal cost, that's sort of the biggest concern and that it, it is becoming more challenging both because of alternative resources but also because in real time, you know, we have less of a handle over what the actual gas prices are and, and Aliso Canyon has made that more difficult as well. Um, with, as far as external resources go, even if we're not, even if we could mitigate to actual marginal cost, there's the issue of um, if there is market power out there and it's not our internal resources that are doing it, if it's market power from an external resource, then uh, we are basically having to choose between sort of a principled point of we're going to mitigate an import because we think it's the right thing to do versus, well, the, if, the, if that import has the choice of selling someplace else, even if the someplace else is a high price due to market power, you know, do we, do we want to actually um, lose that import because we are unwilling to pay the same price that someplace out of California is willing to pay, regardless of whatever the cause is. And so, you know, the, the issues are a bit more nuanced when it comes to non-RA imports in the sense of what, what the possible consequences would be. Tegan, can you go ahead and put the question on through the phone? Hello, um, this is uh, Aldous Pavoto over at PG&E. I just uh, was curious what your thoughts are on the issue of um, essentially for, for for many years, Kaiso has in in um, stakeholder processes where the, where issues about manageability of constraints outside of the market arise. Uh, advocated for using uh, price as a way of managing sort of non-market um, issues that haven't otherwise been captured. For, and a lot of those could be opportunity costs, but they could be other types of issues as well. Um, would you pretty strongly advocate against that, and how would you sort of enable um, uh, in, in this framework uh, some capability to address those kinds of operational issues? I'm not sure I, am, I understand the uh Basically, the, 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 the idea is that, that you're, you, we've, been, we've been told in many circumstances, you know, bid at a very high price in order to uh, um, avoid um, uh, energy being used uh, when it, it, it's not meant to be used. Um, if you mean like uh, energy limited resources offering in high, so we don't use them up right. for frivolous reasons, I mean I think that's appropriate. That's and that's exactly what I want to, what I think we have to dot, work around in mitigation. That we don't want to have something that mitigates down resources that are being reserved for because they're they're the last bullet you want to use. They have they have very high opportunity costs, right. and we don't want to use them because the price is. 47 cents higher than uh, what it otherwise might be. And right. that's so the challenge, think, I think, of mitigation. So the basic principle you're advocating is don't mitigate those resources because they, they're they not in the, in the pivotal position and therefore whatever their bids are, there's a good reason for them and they should be able to do. No, 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 we can't be that blithe and just assume. No, we can't be that blithe and assume they're, that's perfect, that that, 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 oh. that entity is never one that's exercising market power, but we need to be conscious of not applying mitigation in certain situations in which it's very unlikely to be an exercise of market power and only apply it when our test you know, indicates that, well, even though that's an energy limited resource, this is a situation in which it really looks more like the exercise of market power than, than saving that for a rainy day because the price is 999 and whatever. Uh, so I think you, you know, we, uh, that's why it's hard. I mean, that's why I say we don't want to trigger it, mitigation, when we don't think we need it because we, it, there are these hard cases where it's hard to set the, be sure of the default energy bid for all these resources. And, you, it's, you know, if you give a blank slate to people, sometimes maybe it is, they don't do the right thing. So. Right. Well, I agree. It's just hard to implement in an automatic, uh, uh, you know, software-based LMPM system. Right. 
Right. That's why we try to not trigger, you know, all I can say is we try to not trigger mitigation when it's unlikely to be, you know, an exercise of market power. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, I guess that's why, you know, when we were talking about something that would always trigger mitigation because we say the pivotal supplier test is going to assume that the utility withhold all its supply. Well, that's going to trigger mitigation of a lot of those resources in circumstances in which there's no potential for the exercise of market power. So we want to recognize that we've got imperfect measures of cost. We've got resources we want to hold back. So we want to try to avoid situations in which we're gratuitously triggering mitigation. Is there another more person? Okay. Good. Tegan, go ahead and put the last question through, please. Hi, Lindsay Slugway from NV Energy. Um, I'm, I have kind of, well, I have a question on, I'm really struggling on trying to understand why you would just mitigate real time and not the day ahead market as well. And my, my thoughts behind this is that if, well, I understand that your points that in the real time market that there would be less capacity than the day ahead market. I mean, theoretically, that makes sense. But in the real time market, it, there's an expanded footprint that you're optimizing. And also, if you look at the price performance analysis, it shows that the prices in, di or, yeah, in day ahead are consistently higher than real time during instances when capacity is short. So I was wondering if I could get any thoughts or explanation to that. Well, I think uh, my thought is ideally if we thought we had a, a significant market power problem, we'd want to mitigate both in real time and day ahead. That the decision to only mitigate in real time should be driven by factors like it's not clear we have a significant market power problem and there are significant implementation costs to going to both day ahead and real time. And uh, so I agree that if we have a, if we determined we have a significant market power, system market power problem, then our long run strategy should be to apply mitigation both in the IFM and in real time. But that, but the two qualifiers are do we have a real problem and eventually. But that, 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 that should be our long term strategy when we can implement it. Uh, as far as the high prices in the day ahead versus real time, it's, uh, uh, I've seen some of that in 2018, but I know in uh, Guillermo's report, he also noticed, you know, that it was uh, the weather service had high load forecast. Not only did the CAISO have a high forecast, but the load serving entities had load forecasts that were high. So it wasn't just a matter of the prices were high in the day ahead market and this, the load was the same in real time and the prices were lower. It was the load was a lot lower in real time than the choices made by the, the load serving entities in buying power. So it's it's uh, that's not just that's not market power. That's the fact that we're human beings and we can't do a perfect foresight. Uh, yeah, another way to put that is it's not clear if that if the problem is the day ahead prices were too high or the real time prices were too low. Um, so, and I, I guess I would add on to the the day ahead real time thing that I I do think it also depends upon what we're uh, determining as the criterion for mitigation, um, and. I, I, this is not a fully formed uh, uh, thought, but to me, the lack of import bids in the day ahead market means something different than in the real time market. And so, if if the criteria for for mitigation were based upon congestion into California, then I'm, you know, I, I find it much more persuasive that there's an argument to do both day ahead and real time, whereas. Uh, if it's based upon sort of availability of import bids, there are all these other factors that can influence that availability into California and the day ahead market that um, that make make that a, a more troubling uh, sort of threshold criterion. Yeah, I agree totally with that. You know, you think about one of the reasons there might not be supply offers in the IFM is external suppliers didn't realize you know, the, the total load forecast in California, and that's why California load serving entities might put in price cap bids, because they know that if the price is above that, more supply will show up. And they don't want to buy at $900 a day ahead if they know supplies, you know, would be available tomorrow if people realized how high the price was going to be. Are we done? Okay. 
So, all right, we've um, exhausted everybody on the phones. Have exhausted everybody in the room, or are we uh, hungry? Okay, so we're going to break now for lunch, and we are scheduled to come back at 1:30. Uh, Eric, sorry, Eric from Medicine. Just a process question. Then this was originally designed as a process to go to the board to suggest whether or not we should pursue a stakeholder process to look at what market power mitigation would be. This seems to have gone well beyond that. When will you be issuing an opinion about that, and when will this go to the board? Okay. Greg or Rod? Yeah, so the plan is that the MSC will be issuing their opinion a week before the uh, board meeting on November 14th, so that would be, I believe, November 6th is what we're looking at. And so that would go as well as our recommendation to the board, to the November board. And if I understand, that, will the board be taking a formal vote on this or? Uh, how would they no, be blessing this? I don't believe we will be putting forth any type of resolution for the board to vote on. It, it's simply, I, I think it's, it would be our recommendation to the board, also you know, the, EIN, um, the MSC presenting uh, their opinion to the board. Uh, the board wanted to have stakeholders have the opportunity to present their views as well, um, so the board could then um, basically opine themselves on whether they, you know, agreed with the, the ISO's recommendation or think that what we recommended needs to be modified in some way. So, you know, it's not a formal resolution. I don't believe we're planning on doing that, but, you know, clearly we want, you know, to get the board well informed of the issue um, and get their thoughts on, you know, what how they believe we should proceed. Thank you, Craig. Okay. Um, see everybody in about 45, 50 minutes. So 1.30? So we'll do continue with 1.30 yeah. so we can get home. Thanks, Tegan. We're going to break the lunch now. Uh,